You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Devings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 245 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stemmings, and joining me in the PTUK studio, as always, pressing all the buttons and doing things very technical, it's Matt Smith. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome. Yes. Did you miss me last week? Yeah, it was a bit quiet in here without you. Was it? Yeah, I was, I was okay. swinging cats around here. There was, you know, <laughs> so much room. Lots of space. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> the only downside, I suppose. But uh, you're, yes. you're away driving was... uh, coaches. What was I doing yesterday? No, uh, what was I doing? I can't remember. Yes, I was. That's yeah. right. Well done. You were doing the Berry St. Edmunds. I was. Yes. Christmas market. Was it a Christmas market? It was. It was the Berry St. Edmunds Christmas market. Bit and early, actually, I sh- I'll try and find it for early because I forgot. I got, a, I, I got to meet up with Armando while I was there as well. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he does frequent cool. that area. Because Yes, he is, he is sort of based yes. in that, in that yes. sort of area. And that was quite nice. We had a wander around. Uh, slightly torturous because everybody around, because I was driving, of course, mm. but everybody else around me was drinking delicious. Oh, my God, the smell of the mulch wine was just incredible i don't know what their recipe was and i asked her for it and she said no because uh, it was obviously some kind of secret family recipe but oh my goodness <laughs> it was a world of torture is is a, are, are you a mulled wine fan Senev? oh yes uh i drink it by the pint if uh, i right. if I was okay. it. Classy. Uh, yeah but yeah that, uh, yeah the, the glue vine uh, stuff from uh, from germany uh, particularly nice so yeah love all that Ooh. absolutely love it yes. and on that note neville bounds <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Nev? Yeah, very well, thanks. Been a busy week again. Lots of video editing going on in the mm. NevTech studio here. Uh, just finishing off the uh, the Richard John series, which is all done now. And uh, then also making a start on uh, some editing for Captain Nick for his uh, lecture that I recorded the Ooh. other week as well. So, and of course, uh, uh, yeah, lots of... Later on in the show, of course, we do have um, our, our very first episode of the Re- Richard Johns. Yes, we do. Uh, Sir Richard Johns interview. Uh, that's coming up later on in the show, isn't yeah. it, Nev? Yeah, it is. Looking forward to that very much indeed. And uh, thank you, uh, all my chums in the States, for getting up so early to, to watch it as well. That's, uh, oh, that's really nice. But uh, you Dedication. will not be disappointed, I can tell you. Yeah. yeah. So joining us uh, from across the pond, uh, he is... The guy who puts the bee in balloon. Oh it's Grant McCarran. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> oh, now I'm a bit worried about that one. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the bee for bastard or the <laughs> bee for bloody or... Basket, <laughs> basket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basket case? Yeah, that yeah. works. Yeah, definitely basket <laughs> case, absolutely. Now, because now, the last time that I got to speak to you, Sir Grant of McCarran, uh, was in a rather delightful place with uh, a, one of well, one of our, our very favourite listeners, the lovely Jenny in Rome. Of course, we met up in Rome. Yes, that was a lot of fun, mate. Um, if I'm really, really, really lucky, I get to go back there this year. But uh, yeah. you know, we'll see what the world brings. Um, I should be so lucky and all that. I might even be able to bring my lovely wife with me. <gasps> but you know, that's that's uh, f- well, six months down the track. So who knows? Absolutely. Anything's possible, isn't it? Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the way things have been for the last two weeks. Oh, uh, boy, yeah. Anything's possible, yeah. <laughs> so, Grant, I'm guessing all the air shows and stuff uh, season is kind of uh, about to kick off your way because of the weather is obviously it's summertime. Oh, already been, mate. Um, I was doing some commentary and helping out at the Lilydale Air Show just, uh, yeah, last weekend, I think it was. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I was asked to by a couple of the performers to do their commentary for them and then another one found out I was going to be there and said yes you can do mine as well and <laughs> so when I met up with the, the chief commentary guy I, I, I mentioned what was happening and said I'll be here and he said great if you're here all day you can join the team so <laughs> there were three of us and, and it was really good We, the, I got to do my first ever commentary for a um, um, drunken pilot we'll say uh, you know the act where somebody steals a plane and goes and flies it and Dra- almost but not quite drags a wing over the ground and does all sorts of things so yeah um ben lappin a really really fun pilot that from down this way uh does this routine and uh yeah we got to uh, do commentary for it so it was rather amusing yeah I'll bet. Oh, good. i'm glad you've been busy anyway but yeah it's, yeah well, it's, it's, it's starting to happen it's good. starting to happen well welcome and uh, also welcome to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room this morning. Loads of the uh, family members in there. Ray Davis, Liz, Auntie Liz is in there. Uh, we have got Armando is joining us as well this week. Tony S, uh, Mariana is in there. Uh, Marsha's in there. Uh, 
uh, scrolling up, we've got my, our main man Mike is also in the chat room. Uh, Richard Adams, Evan Shu. I'm just scrolling up the list here. Hope I don't miss Chris Griggs. Hello, Chris. Uh, we've got to scrolling up. Richard, well, Rick Bell was in the chat room as well. I don't know whether Rick is still in the chat room. I think he is still in the chat room. And Falco as well. Hello to you, Falco. So welcome to everyone who's joined us in uh, the live chat room today. So as Matt said, we've got loads to get through today. Loads of stuff to get through today, including obviously the first installment of the interview that uh, Nev and Nick uh, done with Sir Richard Johns, which is coming up later in the show. We've also got uh, some feedback as well, which uh, is from, well, it's kind of a, vi a, a listener video uh, from Duxford, from the Battle of Britain Air Show in Duxford, which was this year. Uh, that's coming up later. And also a very special little piece of feedback, which has been sent in uh, for one of the hosts, which is coming up uh, towards the end of oh, the show. Oh, right. Okay. So, without further ado, <laughs> I wonder what that we could are, be. <laughs> <laughs> without further ado, we are going to move things on, right? Uh, as okay. it is coming up to half past ten on Sunday morning on the second yes, yes. of December. On, on, on this occasion, I can actually blame Grant for that for our late start. This is oh. marvellous. Yeah, absolutely. We're having a, we're having a few technical issues from the Australian correspondence office. We'll just re, we'll just <laughs> rename Grant Minecraft. Right. No, 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 no. Hey, no, hey, no. hey, 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 hey! I, I blame a certain pom watching the BBC. Oh, it's um, oh, downstairs. Oh. My, my, our housemate. Do you see? They uh, have a very, well, they have a lovely good guy, way. blue pilot. They have a very good way. The, these Australians of always making it our fault. He's probably watching yeah. it in HD. In, in, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Anyway, this so, is the BBC in HD, streamed live through my feed. Yes, totally. Right. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, anyway on that so bomb show, we are going to start the show then, as we do each week, with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So, if you're ready, Matt, I am. Yes. And if you're ready, Nev. Yeah. Grant. Oh, totally. Let's go. So, kicking off this week's first news story on the CNBC.com website. And uh, headline, Iceland Air scraps plans to buy struggling rival, wow, Air. So, Iceland Air has said it intended to acquire its younger Icelandic rival, wow, Air, early this month. But the group on Thursday scrapped the plan to acquire its Icelandic rival, uh, calling into question the next steps for the struggling budget carrier. Iceland Air said the conditions for the share purchases were unlikely to be uh, filled by the company's shareholders meeting slated for yesterday on Friday. Uh, this conclusion is certainly disappointing for Bogus Iceland's group interim president and CEO, that's Bogus Nils Bogusson. There we go. Uh, and he said that uh, he would like to thank WOW Air's management for a good cooperation in the project during the recent weeks. All our best wishes go out to the owners and staff of the WOW Air. WOW Air's flights first took off in 2012 and has expanded rapidly, adding transatlantic services for several U.S. cities. The airline is a no-frills budget carrier that offers low airfares, some below $100 one way, and charges passengers for everything else, such as seat assignments, carry-on baggage, food and beverages. But Wow Air said it has faced escalating financial problems since its bond issuance in September, including higher fuel costs. Aircraft leases and the company's creditors have demanded stricter payment terms than before, putting further pressure on the company cash flow, Wow Air said in a statement on Tuesday. The airline reduced its fleet by four aircraft earlier this week, and it's not immediately clear what Wow Air's next steps are. The airline, which expanded rapidly has and helped uh, fuel a tourism boom to Iceland, has grappled with other problems, as well as including accusations of poor customer service. So it's... um. A shame, really, because we Did have obviously featured WOW quite I didn't a bit. Realised that, that that there was even a vague hint that, that they were having wow trouble. Were in trouble. Yeah, I, didn't, I know it's a crypto. Did, Did I miss that somewhere, mm. or have they just done yes. a very good job <laughs> of keeping it quiet? <laughs> uh, everyone's been having problems with the fuel prices going up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. It's it's one of those things now. Fuel prices have shot up, mm. and uh, anyone, I think anyone who's doing these these very cheap fares and transatlantic fares i don't think they're making a huge amount of money on right. seat sales for these um particular uh, you know aircraft and these routes but it's a shame really it'd be interesting to see what happens with wow over the next few months whether anyone yeah. will step in and um and buy sort of them. help them yeah, yeah. absolutely well, then, wow maybe about to cry mom mom yes. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I see what you did there. Yeah. It's the Australian <laughs> version of that airline. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, yeah. moving on. Uh, moving on to the next story, which is uh, uh, it's a bit of a bit of a wet story here. Right. For you, okay. Matt. Um, but this one is on the sun.co.uk and. Uh, I must say you're doing a fabulous job of I'm filling segue, while I yes. frantically try to bring this story. But this up, uh, this story yeah. broke earlier this week, and uh, obviously it's for Ryanair. And, yeah, and Matt, I think course, I yeah. think you'll agree. The, uh, Matt will put the pictures up after he's done the story, but it's okay. quite amusing. This one, right? Okay, so Rainy Tin is the headline. The Sun, obviously, quality newspaper. Uh, furious <laughs> Ryanair passengers forced to queue in torrential rain to board plane after paying extra for priority boarding. Okay, so Ryanair passengers at Gatwick. I must admit, I didn't realise they flew into Gatwick. Mm. Okay, anyway. uh, Were forced uh, to wait in torrential rain to board a plane in a long queue after they had paid extra for priority boarding. Uh, Pasha... Uh, passenger Trish Kelly posted a video of the customers as they were caught in the downpour. As I say, we'll try and pl- I'll try and get back to that uh, later on. So they were waiting on the tarmac to board the plane via steps, uh, not via a jet bridge uh, which provides shelter from the elements. Trish wrote, Ryanair, uh, with the forced increase of priority purchases, uh, perhaps you'll pay to connect an air jetty when needed. This was the priority passengers trying to board uh, Gatwick tonight. Customer Joe uh, Kelly replied on the tweet, half the plane in Berlin was priority this evening. Passengers have been complaining of the long queues that they have had to face after buying priority boarding since the airline launched the new rules on hand baggage. Customers uh, have tweeted photos of the queues, bemoaning the fact that the majority of the plane now has to pay extra to wait in line. Matt Charman tweeted a photo of a long queue, writing, How can you advertise as priority priority boarding when over half of the aeroplane has been called priority. Meanwhile, Dr. Natalie Hauer tweeted another photo of a queue and wrote, as expected, Ryanair's new policy that you must purchase priority to get your small bag in the cabin is equals everyone booking priority. I'm not going to keep reading on the story because basically it's all about various tweets and it's going over the same subject matter again and again. I was so, quite shocked at this because I've flown from Gatwick quite a number of times and I've, I've flown from Gatwick on a 737 and I, um, mm. yeah, and I've, I've, they've always used jet bridges. They've never, I've never what with got, Ryanair with any airline. I've never, I right. don't think I've ever boarded an aircraft at Gatwick or even Heathrow and used and, and gone through. Or, you know, walked across the, uh, you know, the the, the tar- with a tarmac as such. Really. I mean, did you did you watch the video? They're standing in the rain, waiting to go on, and the video pans back, and there's the jet bridge not going out to the aircraft. Yeah. It's like. <laughs> Well, that's just rude. I mean, I, I know with Virgin and, and often Qantas when we're loading, um, you, you'll get uh, the first <laughs> 15 see. rows or so up through the front door via the jet bridge. And if it's not raining or not obscenely cold or windy or whatever, they'll, they'll board the rear of the plane through the rear br- door via, via steps. And for some of us, going out via the tarmac, woohee, you know, but it um, doesn't happen to be too often because I'm normally up the front. I think but, I think uh, you know, they... They they'll do both doors to speed up the the book it, the sorry boarding. It's only I mean it's Stansted um, they do do you know, use the you know the actual the apron itself to walk to the aircraft, but uh, South End as well they obviously don't have the air bridges which so obviously the passengers have to walk onto the aircraft. But big airports like Heathrow and Gatwick is um, I'm quite surprised they didn't use the air bridge for this. What do you think, Nev? Technical issues with the air bridge? Yeah, right. Uh, no, I think yeah. probably just Ryanair never in the mood to pay for uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So you're going up the stairs, basically. Yeah, we, we did have a staff story, member though, qualified to run the thing out and back because you do have to be checked out to run it. You can actually damage the aircraft if you screw it up. But yeah, still, oops. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, that, that just uh, that's sort of like, oh look, thrr, is this your knife? Oh, now you're twisting it. Yeah, as I walk past the jet bridge. Thanks. I mean, in the, the rain. Uh, uh, the thing is, the thing is with this though, obviously, I mean, surely that was inevitable when basically more and more people were being forced to pay for a priority boarding. By sheer definition, obviously, more people. People using that would mean literally uh, that it's you know that people are going to be queuing out. In the, um, are we ever going to be in a situation where basically you know perhaps they pay the extra for the air bridge, but just for the passengers who are doing priority boarding? Perhaps <laughs> yeah. maybe that's. Now, maybe that that's is, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> anyone who's not got priority boarding can board in the rain. Yeah, absolutely. Board in the rain <laughs> via the rear steps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and During then those rush are... hour between um, Melbourne and Canberra or Melbourne and Sydney, it's not uncommon to find half the aircraft are uh, gold or platinum um, fl- you know, ultra-frequent flyers. Uh, so, you know, like you've got the, the in Virgin, you've got the purple queue, which is for the gold and platinum and business class. So you yeah. get on fast, and then you've got the red queue for everyone else. And sometimes the red queue is actually shorter, but they have to, pro- they're supposed to process the purple beforehand. And it, it gets really funny because, you, you know, it's like I, I'll go up and I'll swipe my card and they'll be scanning me in. I'm like, send in the suits, as it's often sung to send in the clowns. But, you know, it's all good fun. So, I mean, I mean, forgive my, my naivety on this here, but may, maybe, so let, obviously, I mean, these are all, we, we all, well, here in the UK, all right, maybe not Nev, but the rest of us have all, you know, been using Ryanair because basically otherwise, for example, the only reason I was able to come and see you in, in Rome, Grant, was because the price was ridiculously yeah. sensible. I mean, that was the only reason I was able to get on an aeroplane. Uh, obviously helped by the fact that we planned it, you know, what, sort of nearly three months in advance and all that kind of thing. A helping uh, factor. Yeah, absolutely. So it helps to get the prices. But may- maybe the answer to Ryanair's woes on issues of this nature is to actually set a sensible price because presumably there is much otherwise they wouldn't be selling so i mean what i think my my flight out to come and see um you was 60 65 70 pound return i think when i went out to to rome and back which is not unreasonable i mean it's a very very good price but presumably i wasn't the only one there was a lawful lot of people who were doing it at that price um am, am i missing the the point here where essentially that uh, if if they set all of them, so rather than doing these silly prices where you can have twenty seats at like you know nine ninety nine or whatever, so set it maybe at a slightly higher but more sensible, realistic price where people can then put stuff in in underneath, you know, without having having to need to do this. Uh, am I am I missing the point? Dude. Bzzz, sorry, yellow card for using logic in aviation. Oh my apologies. <laughs> well, sorry, logic with uh, you know, low cost carriers. Yeah, no fair point. I mean, Nev, what do you think? Maybe there should be uh, an option on your app, you know, would you like to board via the air bridge <laughs> or stand outside getting wet and right. there's a five pound difference between the two. Or well, like that. I don't know. Okay, look, I, I, I've got to say, I would, if I'd paid for priority boarding and then was forced to stand in the, in the rain and all that, I would probably be a little Quite daft. cross, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, because I mean, when you're, pay, okay, when you're paying for Ryanair, you know you're getting the lowest of the low, the cheapest of the cheap, <laughs> second only to Thromby Airlines here in Australia. But anyhow, um, <laughs> that's Sorry, a friend of mine's car- cartoon sessions on Thromby Air. It's a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, you, you, you get what you pay for, uh, but you've paid for more. So you're, you're still getting the bus line treatment, but you're just, you know, maybe getting first to the queue in the bus. I don't know. It's, if, you, if you really want to have the great experiences like we used to have, this is one of the, my pet peeves is when people go, oh, remember how good it was in the old days? Oh, yeah. Yeah, remember when we used to pay 10 times as much to go between Melbourne and Sydney? Yeah, pay the money. You know, yeah. go first class, go on a real aircraft, you know, real airline. Don't, don't go on a flying bus. But then, uh, uh, again, so, so the flip side to, to, to that argument is that the way that air aviation used to be would essentially, for you know, you know, I, I fit into, into the category of, of low income here in the UK, uh, and that um, that would mean that flying to places like we did the other, you know, the, like Rome again. I'm yeah. using an example because that is literally the last flight that I took. Um, if we were playing what old school prices, I mean, it would be completely out of reach. It. I couldn't do it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. I and mean, that's the thing. These, you know, Ryanair and all the other low-cost carriers—they've opened up the world to to aviation. And you know, we've got people flying. You know, in the past, it was a huge thing if you and the family went on the plane. Geez, and I'm not, not talking that far ago. You know, 90s, 80s—that was huge. You know, big, big thing to put the whole family on a plane to go away for Christmas or whatever. Now, ah, oh, shoot, let's go see a show up. You know, thousand k up the road. Yeah, yeah, let's jump on the plane and go do it. So it's opened all that kind of stuff up. So if you're going for the discount airlines, you've got to, you know, buyer beware, be ready for it. 
you know, when you went on Ryanair going across to Rome and all this kind of stuff, you were ready for a bus with wings, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, like, I wasn't expecting to have, you know, caviar in, and, and all that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and great service and huge space and wonderful boarding and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, damn it, suck it up, princess. Yeah, we paid absolutely. £50 pound or £70 yeah. pound for return for a flight. You know, yeah. everyone can just, you know, go, well, yeah, cut some slack, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this this is the thing. I mean, it's just I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Nev, how do you feel about all this? <laughs> I'd just like to move on to the next story because okay. we go from uh, you know that end of the market to, yeah, to the posh the end. Top end of the yes. Market. What's this oh, next I one? Say. So the next next one, Nev, is uh, obviously a BA one for you, and it's regarding an aircraft that we all love. We do, and I've flown on um, most of the BA seven six sevens actually, uh, but of course they've retired and uh, they've consigned their 767 fleet to the history books uh, this week with the retirement of its last two aircraft, uh, concluding almost three decades of service. Uh, the airline's final scheduled uh, 767-300ER service took place on the 25th of November, uh, operating as BA-663 between Larnaca, Cyprus and Heathrow. Uh, senior cockpit and cabin crew members staffed the flight, leading the farewell celebrations for the twin jets. Uh, retiring BA-767 Captain Julie Levy uh, described the aircraft as a classic workhorse and raised the toast with all on board, expressing for many of us on board this is quite an emotional experience charged with much nostalgia and sentiment we've grown very fond of this dear boeing and she's become like a like a dear old friend the final service which was fully occupied was operated by golf bravo zulu hotel alpha at parting larnica at 20 hundred local and arriving at heathrow at 2225 uh, this aircraft operated with BA for 20 years, having been delivered in May 1998, according to Flight Fleet's analyzer. Uh, the uh, airline states that this machine alone carried around 4 million passengers and flew an estimated 23 million miles over nearly 23,000 flights. The airline's first Dash 300ER, Golf Bravo November Whiskey Bravo, was delivered in February 1990, operating its first revenue services to uh, Paris Charles de Gaulle the same month. And at its peak, the 28-strong fleet of Rolls-Royce RB211 powered twin jets comprised aircraft configured for both long and short-haul operations. As the airline has gradually wound down its 767 fleet, the last remaining examples were part of the Euro fleet, featuring 259 seats. Uh, following the end of the uh, 2018 summer season, just two examples remained, operating a limited schedule throughout November, predominantly on the BA 662 and 663 rotations to Larnaca. Uh, on the 26th of November, BA's last two aircraft, which is uh, Hotel Alpha and Hotel Bravo, were ferried from, St, uh, from Heathrow to St. Athen in Wales for storage and eventual scrapping. According to Fleet's analyzer, 10 of BA's 767s have been retired to St. Athen since uh, uh, August 2016. Uh, BA was actually the launch customer for the RB211 powered 767 in 1987, but only 31 with these engines were built from a total current production run of over 1,100 aircraft. The majority of 767s are powered by Pratt & Whitney and General Electric engines. BA chose Rolls Power to allow for some commonality with its RB211 powered uh, Boeing 747, 757 and TriStar fleets. Uh, well, I must say, I've really enjoyed flying on the 767. I've flown it on sort of the medium haul sectors to Cyprus. Uh, I've flown it across the pond from Gatwick to, uh, I think it was JFK or Newark. And But uh, more recently, I've been flying it uh, from um, Heathrow to Glasgow and Heathrow to Edinburgh. So obviously, they're very short haul sectors, but they can cram a lot of people in. So they were running them on, on the first and last flights of, of the day, uh, usually. They were looking a bit tired towards the end no question about it the uh, the interiors left a little bit to be desired uh but the sound of those rolls royce mm. rb211 on takeoff uh, mm -hmm. were was very nice indeed i've got to say if you go on to youtube there's actually a really good video on youtube of both these um of both these aircraft coming into uh st athen in wales for storage um, I think it's, it's one of the big um, aviation bloggers on YouTube has got um, um, a video which they shot in high def of these of these two aircraft flying into mm, yeah. St. Athens, which is really good to watch. And uh, it's all they also have the ATC banter between the pilots and the, and obviously the ground controllers, which is quite amusing to listen to because I think the either I think the first 
aircraft, Hotel Alpha, that flew into St. Athens was actually flown by um, one of the senior captains at BA, and he was actually retiring. That was his last flight. So he flew that aircraft into, into St. Athens on his uh, retirement flight, which is quite nice. But um, good story, that, Nev. I, I do like the 7.6. I've flown on the Dash 400 foot with um, Delta, which uh, was uh, was quite nice. But a shame to see them all going. But I'm sure that um, a lot of these will be c continuing on around the globe, obviously being used for a lot of the use for cargo. Well, I mean, ne Nev was obviously saying there that a lot of the interiors and stuff were looking quite tired toward the end there. And, of course, that video that I was playing up there, which was uh, where I think one of the cabin crew had taken a video and, and, and posted it. And I, I can't remember the last time I saw, um, you know, the aircraft with all the screens, like not the screens in the headrests, <laughs> but actually coming down from the sea. I mean, and I don't do a they lot got, of flying. They're, they're, they're well, using the, um, the CRT screens in, in the last <laughs> yeah. ones. Oh, well. wow. So very old stuff. So, yes. I mean, so, so, some <laughs> yeah. of that makes me feel quite nostalgic, though, because actually, hmm. you know, it... <laughs> I, just, I love the sort of the historical element to it, you know. It is literally a, a parked museum now to uh, tech of all kinds. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So moving on to the next story, and uh, Grant, this one is uh, a special Qantas story for you. Yes, I did figure this one for me as it's got down under in it. So uh, <laughs> planning, oh, sorry, the, the title is, This airline is now weighing passengers carry on luggage. Consumer advocates say it's just the latest example of how the airline industry nickel and dimes travellers. Planning to fly down under? You might want to keep your carry-on luggage down under a certain weight. Australian airline Qantas is cracking down on people who travel with heavy carry-on bags, according to a report published this week by Australian newspaper The Daily Telegraph. Uh -oh. It's all in the name, guys. Passengers whose bags exceed the airline's carry-on weight of 7 kilos will be forced to gate-check them. Oh, by the way, that's 15.4 pounds. Um, in a statement to the Daily Telegraph, Qantas defended the move and said it was attempting to make the boarding process fair for all travellers because many passengers attempt to game the system by overloading their carry-on bags to avoid having to check luggage. Side note from me, um, many people try and carry on luggage so they don't have to check it so they don't wind up standing there for up to an hour waiting for the luggage to come off the carousel. Yeah. Yeah, of but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> Back to the article. The airline also argued the renewed focus on luggage weight would ensure that the boarding process was faster and safer because some passengers struggle to lift heavy bags into the overhead bins without assistance from flight crew. Yeah, I'll cop to that. I've uh, seen people trying to lift stuff. If you can't lift it, don't take it, guys and gals. But uh, back to the article. But consumer advocates don't buy those arguments. Some took particular issue with the contention that heavy bags endanger flight crew, given that the weight limit is relatively low. This smells of a money grab to me, said Christopher Elliott, a consumer advocate. Flight attendants have to be able to open those cabin doors and help passengers. They have to be able-bodied to take Qantas's logic to its conclusion. That means that flight attendants can't lift more than 15 pounds. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to hold there for a sec. Um, <laughs> let's start talking about our weight restrictions coming to US-based airlines, blah de blah de blah um, Out of interest, um, one of the things that has come up on this is that uh, Jetstar, you can pay a little bit extra and you can get 10 kilos. So, oh, so it's okay at 7 kilos, but if you pay extra, you can get 10 kilos. But again, Jetstar do say you have to put it in the overhead yourself. So I'm a big fan of up to 10 kilos. I don't see about the 7 kilos, especially if you've got a solid shell. That's a couple of kilos right there. Um, I would, So long as people can do it themselves, I, I don't see any real hassle with 10 kilos. The, the big... Because that, that at least lets those of us who are just going for a day or two carry everything on board with us, including our laptops. But the other part is you're allowed two bags. What they're not talking about here is I can take a carry-on up to seven kilos if I fly Qantas, and Virgin's doing something similar, by the way. Uh, and I can also take my laptop bag, all for the ladies, your handbag. Um, <laughs> so, Or a carry-on, a laptop bag, and a handbag if you smile sweetly. Right. But the... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I've seen some ladies getting away with that. But yes. the, the upshot is that, okay, so I can have two seven kilos, that's 14 kilos, one in the overhead and one under the seat in front of me. So it, it just gets really interesting. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, this is an argument that could, we can we can go on and on and on about, really, isn't it? With the carry, on, carry on's okay if you're going away for a short time, but obviously if you're going away on a big holiday, you need, you need a big suitcase. Ooh. Yeah. Here's the thing. I'm going to Canberra for a couple of days, right? So typically what I'm trying to do is put what I can in my laptop bag and my carry-on bag. Uh, I'm quite happy with the laptop bag under the seat in front of me, mostly because I've got a little bit of extra space up the front. But um, no, and I'm not in business, just making that clear. But um, <laughs> the, the, the upshot is that for a lot of people, they just want to get off the plane, 
grab you know with their gear not have to wait around at the carousel go straight to the, the taxis and get out and get on with their day and yeah you know, there's a few of us who don't try and plan our day around and i always don't have my first meeting at 10 even though i know i'll be in the office in canberra at least nine um sometimes earlier but it's like you know when, when it can take 45 minutes and you're in the air for 50 minutes I have seen that coming back into Melbourne, and I've tweeted at the guys and, you know, both them at the airport and and the airline, going, "What the frack? You know, yeah. why are we still standing here waiting? I've, I've had time to go to the lounge, refresh, mm. grab a nibble, come down, and there's everyone still waiting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's if if they fix that problem, then more people will check their luggage. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I I think it's fair to say, Nev, that's a similar problem that we're having here in the. The UK is it where it's uh, people are having to wait so long for their their stuff at the, you know coming out of the carousel essentially in, in the airport that, that that that's why people are going to great lengths to avoid having to do it. It does yeah. depend, doesn't it? I mean, sometimes it works a treat, and actually we've had some really good uh, service at Heathrow just recently. You know mm. that in fact your bags have arrived before you have, um, mine because really? you've been in a big passport queue and the, uh, <laughs> the, the passport stuff doesn't work properly. But that's not. Hey, story. hang uh, on but, a minute. Um, maybe maybe this is all a big ruse, Nev. Maybe it is literally the reason why why passport they've been cutting all the staff at passport control is so that the the bags are waiting for you when you get through there. So you're so worried, that, annoyed with passport control, you forgot forgotten about the bag that it used to take <laughs> forever to get your bags out of the carousel <laughs> yes there is that isn't there but uh, nonetheless i think you are right people are trying to cram more and more stuff on the aircraft because they don't want to pick it up at the other end yeah definitely. i was just having visions yep. of those e-gates you know when you get through and there's like 15 e-gates and two are open okay the other ones are all broken oh don't go there <laughs> anyway, moving on to the next story, and this one is on the newsandstar.co.uk, and a very nice story, this one. It's uh, EasyJet Airline Captain from Carlisle wins Woman of the Year Award. So a Carlisle woman has been celebrating among the outstanding talent of the UK travel industry as she was named Woman of the Year. Kate McWilliams, an airline captain for EasyJet, picked up her latest award at the 2018 IBM uh, Every Woman in Travel Awards. Initially nominated as the finalist in tomorrow's leader category, Kate was relieved not to win as she had not prepared an acceptance speech. Uh, she was even more shocked and unprepared when she eventually realised she'd won the top award. She said, it's such an honour to be a finalist. I never imagined I'd win my category, never mind the main award of the event. I'm so lucky to have such a great support of my colleagues who were there with me on the day to celebrate my achievement. It came just two weeks after uh, she was honoured in an outstanding new ambassador for science, technology, engineering and mathematics uh, at the STEM Awards for her efforts to encourage the next generation. At the age of 26, she became the world's youngest commercial airline captain. She discovered for her love of flying when she was 13 years old after joining the Air Cadets the youth wing of the Royal Air Force. On her 19th birthday, she started her commercial flying training, and by the age of 21, she was flying passengers all over Europe with EasyJet. The discouragement she faced from others along her career journey only fueled her for, uh, to uh, even more to succeed. A spokesperson for Every Woman said, in a world where only 5% of airline pilots are female, Kate's achievements are exceptional, and she is now reaching out to thousands of young girls and boys, encouraging them to also career, uh, consider a career in aviation. Isn't that nice? Mm, That's a really good story to hear. And, uh, God, she's started early. Yeah. Blimey, fly, you know, to get uh, obviously commercial license and stuff at that age. Fantastic work. Excellent. So the next story then, Matt, and this one for you is uh, this is on the simpleflying.com website. And uh, it's another EasyJet story for you, Matt. Yeah, indeed. So uh, the headline on, on said story is actually that EasyJet is set to launch um, a point. What's, oh, no, I don't, want, I don't want a notification uh, did, does anybody else get that? It drives me nuts at the moment. Yeah, stop mm. it, everyone. Uh, anyway, EasyJet sets to launch points uh, based loyalty program in 2020. EasyJet is to invest heavily in their loyalty program over the next few years. Currently, the airline offers two loyalty programs, one paid for, the other is strictly invite only. Ooh. While the paid program is fairly similar to a legacy carrier's free reward scheme, I presume something like Avios points, is that what they mean? Yeah. That sort of system. Um, 
The the free invitation only program currently offers fairly few benefits. Despite speculation that this news would be announced earlier in the year, the news was formally announced by the company's most recent financial presentation. So the current schemes, uh, so there are currently two schemes offered by EasyJet. The first is called EasyJet Plus. With EasyJet Plus, passengers are required to pay £199 a year. This, however, gives them most of the benefits of a flexi booking. Even if even if on a cheap booking, EasyJet Plus members receive free seat selection, uh, priority boarding, fast track security, access to dedicated bag drops, in addition to a couple of others. Uh, with in other words, it equates to a standard airline loyalty scheme. The other scheme currently offered is known as EasyJet Flight Club. This is a free scheme offered to frequent travellers, as the program is by invoice invite only in order to qualify as frequent tra traveler you must reportedly fulfill one of the following criteria so you must have flown 20 easyjet flights in the last 12 months <laughs> flown 10 plus flights amounting to over 1500 pounds in the past 12 months or flown an average of 10 flights a year over the past 10 years with at least one flight a year so yeah okay not over yeah uh, the benefits well you know there's a stuff up here because we're talking about flight club first rule don't talk about flight, flight club. club right yes <laughs> of course yes my apologies uh, so the benefits of this program uh, are not the same as EasyJet Plus. Instead of offering the little perks that uh, make a traveller's day, the main benefit of fight, Flight Club is that uh, flight change fees are waived. So according to EasyJet, their new scheme will, scheme will help to keep customers coming back. This is much the same as when you visit the same coffee shop to get your card stamped. According to EasyJet's data, 66% of seats in FY18 uh, presumably financial year eight, uh, 2018, were booked by customers who had booked with EasyJet in the previous two years. Additionally, returning customers will book twice as many bookings as the first time uh, EasyJet customers. Yeah. <laughs> is that because first time round they didn't like it? Uh, now, <laughs> now, now EasyJet is going to change its frequent flyer scheme to be available to everybody. All passengers will be able to collect and spend points on EasyJet purchases. In 2019, EasyJet will begin to roll uh, will begin the rollout by developing the new technology required and launching it in the UK. Secondly, in 2020, the program will roll out across Europe and expand to include EasyJet holidays. The airline will also introduce a business reward scheme in 2020. Uh, I should just say for the record there, actually, I am personally quite a fan of flying with EasyJet. I've yeah, uh, same here. only done so. it four times, I have to confess, and I haven't had a single problem on those four times that I have used them. So I, I'm not going to sit here and, and berate them. If uh, the, the second scheme that they, that they have in place with the invite-only thing I think doesn't seem that great. But uh, if you are flying re uh, frequently, and I suppose that ability, because I presume they have a similar thing where you're having to pay for priority boarding and that mm. kind of thing. So actually, if you are flying regularly, perhaps that 190 nine pounds in the grand scheme of a 12 month period is not that bad for the perks that you're you're getting as a result perhaps. I think it's a good idea i think it's for people who travel for business or pleasure you frequently using easyjet which a lot of people do it's a yeah. good idea but i was just looking having a quick look at the uh, the easyjet the uh, sky wards thing i didn't realize actually uh, emirates have uh, a sky wards program um which i'm a member of a silver member Albeit, uh, but they actually do a, a a share with EasyJet. So if you're if you're an Emirates uh, Skywards member, you can also use your Skywards points to book EasyJet flights. Didn't know can that. You? So that's quite good. Okay. Yeah, big airline like Emirates, and they yeah they um very much and friendly with uh, with EasyJet. So yeah, it's a good okay. idea. Yeah, very. Good. Uh, so next up, Nev. What's this one for you on the... Well, this is on the doncasterfreepress.co.uk. Wow. Not a, a website we normally visit for aviation <laughs> news, but uh, I think Carlos has excelled himself with this one because this website has got the most pop-ups and videos that I've ever seen <laughs> when you launch the page. It's taken me a good five minutes to disable all the nasty business so we can actually get to the story. But the story says uh, the sky's the limit as British Airways starts its search for 2,000 new cabin crew in Yorkshire. And uh, successful candidates with no prior cabin crew experience will train through the airline's new cabin crew apprenticeship scheme, uh, getting their career off to a flying start. See what they did there? Uh, 
Um, <laughs> after completing an intense cabin crew training course at British Airways Global Learning Academy, including the very best training in customer service and aviation safety and security, apprentices will continue their learning journey in the air and on the ground. The program will see them gain qualifications in English, maths, and digital skills, access to a dedicated mobile app to track their progress, and continuous development coaching from a certified apprenticeship coach. The airline's initiative reflects the government's push to increase and enhance the number and quality of apprenticeships offered in the UK to improve core skills and the quality of training offered. BA has a long tradition of running quality apprenticeship schemes with apprentices currently working in engineering, customer service and head office roles. The airline's Global Learning Academy has recently achieved the status of a registered employee uh, employer provider of apprentices apprenticeships, enabling it to continue delivering specialist airline learning whilst offering uh, employees enhanced skills and professional qualifications. Dozens of apprentices from across the airline uh, attended Skills London this weekend, the UK's biggest careers event for 15 to 24 year olds, and spoke to thousands of young people about their experience as an apprentice at British Airways. Victoria Bromley, the customer service apprentice, said, uh, my apprenticeship at British Airways has been the perfect way to begin my career in the aviation industry. The opportunity available are amazing and I couldn't have asked for better support throughout. I'm so proud of what I've achieved so far and really excited for the future. I would absolutely recommend an apprenticeship for everyone. Well that applies in so many areas of business isn't it? You know if you can have an apprenticeship scheme something where you uh, do learning and on-the-job training that that kind of thing is, is really good and it's the only way you really get to pick up the skill set. Also you need you know some core skills beforehand but um, you do need to actually uh, work with people as well uh, during the early part of your training. So well, I think it's a very uh, very good and worthwhile scheme by the sounds of things. Yeah, it's good. It's uh, there may have been some fabulous uh, pictures to go with that story, Nev, but I'm still working through the questionnaire you have to fill in before you're allowed to actually look at the stories. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I, <laughs> wow, yeah, this is... A, so, yeah, I'm sure there were some lovely pictures, but I'm afraid I'm unable to show them because uh, I'm still answering the online survey. <laughs> no, it's, it's, like you said, Nev, it's a brilliant idea, and I think it's, it's good that BA are offering this up to, uh, you know, the apprenticeship scheme because the trouble is a lot, lot of jobs nowadays and stuff within the industry and you look at the jobs online uh, in various aspects of the aviation industry and they want 4 million A-levels and yeah. 50,000 um, GCSEs, mm. yeah. uh, A-level A and above and yeah, that kind uh, of cuts uh, most of the population out I think. Also, I mean, I know very little about um, obviously this, this kind of work but I know from conversations, uh, obviously we've, we've all got friends who, who are cabin crew and... Uh, usually ironically having no experience when going for a cabin crew uh going for a cabin crew position is quite often actually more beneficial mm. um apparently because obviously you know if you've worked for a previous airline their procedures will be very different and therefore they've almost got to retrain you as where sometimes it's actually easier to just if you don't know if you've never done it before it's much easier to just get you to, to learn their way uh you haven't got anything to compare mm. it to perhaps so uh yeah it sounds, it sounds exciting it's it's uh I, I, you know, it, it's not the most glamorous job in the world, but you know, um, certainly from from what I've been hearing about it, uh, it, it, if you're right with the right airline, it can be an amazing Very true. experience and an amazing experience. So the next story is on the airlinegeeks.com, and it's a Qantas story, especially for you, Grant. Yeah, there are. I, I assume there are other airlines that that fly out of Australia because you just seem to keep giving Grant no, stories. No, about no, 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 it's Qantas and nothing, mate. It's Qantas. Right, and nothing. Yeah, I've uh, seen the advertising over there. It's yeah, yeah. Qantas. It's Australian for airline. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, so I see what Carlos is doing here because I'm looking ahead and I'm going, oh, really? Uh-huh, yeah. So I see the trend. But anyhow, the title of this one is Qantas Fly's Final Boeing 747 Service from Los Angeles. And this one runs. When Qantas flight QF-56 departed from Los Angeles bound for Brisbane Thursday evening, it marked the final departure of a Qantas 747 aircraft from Los Angeles International Airport. The flight closed an important chapter in Qantas's history and one of its longest as the airline has been operating the popular yet aging jumbo jet between Australia and Los Angeles for nearly 50 years, earning icon status amongst aviation enthusiasts around the world. And in the interest of people's sanity, the camera's off and the quality of the audio oh. should improve. 
<laughs> Sorry, I, guys. I'd sneakily put the picture up there for everybody. So it's, uh, <laughs> God, I noticed. He's very stealth-like, isn't he? Oh, he's, there he, carry on, carry on. Anyhow, moving, moving, moving on. Yes, th- thanks to the BBC being streamed downstairs. You, you really don't want video. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyhow, Qantas 747 service to Los Angeles, uh, Qantas's largest gateway to the United States, first began in 1972 when Qantas flew its first 747 from Australia to the United States to augment its current Boeing 707 service at the time. As Qantas began phasing the 707 out of its fleet, the 747 quickly dominated its route network and set the new standard for Australian aviation serving cities as far away as New York via a single stop in Los Angeles. Although it's time with the aircraft is coming to an end, it's been quite a strong and long-lasting love affair between the two that lasted longer than most would have expected considering the rate at which most airlines are retiring their 747 fleets. Going strong for 51 years now, the aircraft and airline duo first met in 1967 when Qantas, a young upcoming airline, but well, they've been around for a while, but looking kind of cute in its outfit, placed its first order for the Boeing 747-200B, a brave and dashing new airliner. When Qantas's national carrier received its first 747 in 1971, it began a whirlwind relationship that saw Qantas acquiring all of the models that came after the 200, including the 300, SP, 400 and 400ER with the only exception being the 747-8i, because even Qantas won't take that one. <laughs> there was a time when, I've got to say it, there was a time when even Quant, when Qantas was so in love with the 747, it operated an all-747 passenger fleet and is the only airline in the world to ever do so. As times change, however, so does technology and the needs of an airline. New ultra-modern and next-generation air, aircraft, such as the Boeing 787-9 Dreamliner and Airbus A380 are becoming the new face of the 98-year-old airline, with New York seeing its 747 service replaced with Dreamliner service in September, amongst other destinations. The total number of 747s Qantas has operated throughout the years topped 65 aircraft, now down, down to nine and dwindling further still. Should I continue, guys, or are we pretty happy with that? Yeah, I think uh, no, that's all right. That works pretty well. Do you think do you yeah, think it's the right move for Qantas to to get rid of all the seven fours? Well, they should have got rid of the seven four sevens a long time ago uh, because they are an expensive aircraft to operate with the fuel. They're getting old; they're long in the tooth. The newer stuff does go do better, but they had the opportunity for the triple seven. But there was a, an, an entrenched um, group within Qantas in the senior area who said, "Not on four engines will I go across the Pacific." So, uh, you know, sorry, not less than four engines. So, thus, the set triple seven didn't happen. Whereas everyone else jumped on it, they did wind up going on the A three eighty. And and personally, I quite like the A three eighty. I have uh, enjoyed my flight on it. But um, even if the windows are a bit small, but the uh, you know, unfortunately, everyone's one, going two question, airlines, no. two two engine one airlines. Question, um, sorry. I was just saying one question, Grant. I didn't never realise that um, uh, Qantas operated the 747 SP. I just uh, yes. never heard of that. Before. Primarily oh, for, uh, well, one of the routes was for Wellington, New Zealand, where the uh, the runway was too short to get a full 747-100 or 200 into. But the uh, SP, the pocket rocket, did quite well. It had the wings of, I believe, the one or I think it was the 100 model, but a shorter fuselage. So uh, it, uh, it, it really was able to take off in a much small, smaller distance and Wellington Airport is constrained by uh, uh, water either end so that was one of the routes I'm sure there were others that they operated it on that it, it was quite handy for but uh, yeah look the, the SP they, they pretty much operated everything except the 8i as noted here but uh, I like the photo uh, if Matt if you can get to the article and pop the photo up uh, it's a lovely photo of a very clean looking um, 747 at San Francisco, uh, I can assure you that if you get up close and personal with the ones remaining, a lot of them look like uh, they've been around the bush a bit. Um, there's panel lines and a number of other things that indicate that the the old girls are getting a bit long in the tooth. I mean, that, that, that photo was actually quite nice, but I was on the tarmac the other day up pretty close to one. Um, and I was looking at it going, oh, wow, yeah, you've, you've seen a lot of flights. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've worked hard for your paint job. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, you've done your time, old girl. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, look, one of the things that uh, everyone's loving the, the twin engines, the 777s, the 78s, A350s, A330s, there's a lot of reason to love them. But, uh, you know, because four engines, it's, a, it's two extra engines to maintain, it's more fuel burn, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, 
the thing is, uh, you've got to have the ability to still continue your fl- your takeoff mm-hmm. and your departure with only one engine operating. And so, if a triple seven with those engines that are wider than the fuselage of a seven three seven loses one on takeoff, the remaining engine has to be able to do it even at hot and high conditions. That's why Abu Dhabi and places like that and the Middle East are building longer and longer runways. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons why some of the Middle Eastern carriers love the A380 because one out of three is a whole lot different to one out of two when you lose an engine. So um, if temperatures continue to climb and we continue to have situations where, oh, my God, it is like way above 40 to 50 degrees Celsius and you're trying to take off, you, you most aircraft with two engines, you've got to offload fuel or freight or people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whereas with a four engine, you can get away with it a bit. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes over the next few years, whether the, the Airbus can hold the A380 in long enough to be able to get people going, oh, crap, we but, do need it because of performance on takeoff. And, and, and whilst, whilst that obviously is a ma- major factor, obviously, I mean, of course, it's the cost of fuel, I presume, is, is one of the reasons why uh, they're not as popular as they were, certainly from the airliner's point of view. Because, I mean, huge uh, you know, it must be, yeah, it must make a huge difference on, on the actual cost of, of flying the aircraft. Not so much the purchase price, because I suppose you could argue, you know, however much you paid for it is kind of irrelevant, you know, when you decided to go down that road. But, you know, flying the, the, the thing is, is a major factor, isn't it, if it's got four engines well, over two? Yeah. Each, each engine is, you know, uh, you've got an additional two engines you've got to do maintenance on, you've got to organize things. I mean, yes, the 777 and the A350, they've got big engines and all that, so they technically do do, do burn a lot more on takeoff and everything. But in cruise, it's, it's a lot cheaper on the fuel burn, uh, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, an, a, an A380 with 800 people on it is pretty economical if you well, just yeah. do a pure, you know, uh, economy seats. layout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So moving on to the next story, which is on theguardian.com. And uh, we've all seen the stories in the uh, last few months about uh, wanting to cut down the amount of pilots on the flight deck and have uh, one uh, one pilot on the flight deck. Or driverless cars, that's always a big one mm. in the news. But how about driverless snow plows at the airport? No? Silence there. See, see what the story says. Well, you know, it's it's not like you're going around quarters and and having other cars to deal with. <laughs> you control the airport, baby. <laughs> so Good two point. robots adapted from manned snow plows are ready for use at Oslo Airport this winter. Let's face it, they do need snow plows in Oslo. Yeah. So how does the snow plow driver get to work? Not a problem for the new snow plows, keeping Oslo's airport runways clear. This winter, because they are driverless snow plows. After successful tests at Fagernes Airport in Norway last winter, the plows are ready for the big time. Uh, Yeti Snow Technology are supplying two robotic vehicles and a central control centre. The robots are adapted from manned snow plows with automated controls on the steering, throttle and brakes. They are guided by GPS and communicate via 4G modems. Nevertheless, cars are not allowed uh, yet allowed on the roads but uh, yeti project manager john halden says that the plows do not need to be sophisticated the open level setting and absence of traffic makes them their task much simpler runways are usually only closed for 15 minute periods so the plows have to clear them efficiently in one pass each plow clears a swathe of 5.5 meters wide and the two drive together in formation hmm a driver in the cab will monitor operations during the testing and learning phase. After that, the machines will run unmanned. Uh, this will guarantee that the plows are available 24 hours and can operate whenever and for as long as they are needed, even when it's too snowy to get to the airport. Driverless pl- That's not a bad idea, I suppose, but I always worry it's doing someone out of the job. Well, I mean, I, I suppose you could argue that uh, in this particular instance, as the, uh, you know, they're experimenting with two snow plows, one person still has to operate it. So I suppose mm. you're, you, you're losing one job as opposed to two, I suppose. But uh, There's only one part well, of can... that story that concerns me slightly, and that's 4G. <laughs> that's worrying, isn't it? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong there? Good point, yes. And also, well, because it, it doesn't need the bandwidth, and 4G is slightly more reliable than 5G. 
in terms of you know 5G communications, antennas, things like that, congestion, etc. We know all the rest. Oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> Just a food for thought. I mean, you know, it seems like. I, uh, the good old days of analog. I used to be able to hold a call even going through a yes. under a tunnel. Mm. Nowadays, on four G, you go the train goes under a bridge and it drops out. You know mm. all this kind of stuff. Maybe um, maybe their chosen yeah. method of communication should Nev. I don't know if you'll agree with this. Perhaps they should go to GPRS then, if that's you know sort of really push the boat out. It'll be stable. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but obviously the, the other thing is in Norway, in fact, that part of the world, generally the the amount of population is considerably less, so uh, there, there's far less bandwidth congestion, I would imagine. So, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah. Sounds like an interesting. It's uh, a long time since I've heard the word but, modem as well. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, here's here's a thought on on Carlos's comment regarding um, a person done out of work. Well, you know, maybe they can go and be repurposed to drive catering trucks or uh, other <laughs> or you know, stair tasks. Trucks. Yeah, stair I mean, trucks. Everyone's Airstairs, really yeah. worried about AI and the potential for AI to just, and robots and all that to destroy jobs. And yes, they will destroy jobs. It will happen. Yeah. Just like everyone lost their jobs who built buggy whips. Yeah. Guess what? They went on and did other things. Mm -hmm. uh, what you found is that, yes, there's been so many jobs destroyed, but new jobs have been created and things like that. Yeah. So... It's so long as we're making sure that those who lose their jobs are getting retraining to go into new jobs or other jobs and things like that, uh, and that I see as a big responsibility on on government things like that is not to to protect and keep a, a job in an industry that's dying like a coal fired you know power station, but to retrain those coal staff to work on things like solar or wind. Yeah, you know, it's that kind of world. When when Australia started shutting down car plants. Um, it's amazing the number of people who used to work. Yes, a lot of them lost their jobs. A lot of them are at, still out of work. But there's a lot of them who have wound up working for places like Moran who build bits for the F-35. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, it must be the same. Also, you know, Nev, the industry that you work in, I mean, it must be very similar in the fact that, you know, uh, the technology that you used to use was huge, wasn't it? So not only did you have a cameraman, but you had to have a sound guy because it's all the guy, the guy holding the camera could do was to hold it um, and, and this kind of thing. I mean, uh, and you think, I mean, a lot of these films, film crews and stuff they're going out with one person and they're doing everything they're doing the reporting the the lot yeah it was it was a massive issue uh in the uk and australia actually uh, especially with the unions uh back in the day i think it was the early 80s when we went from uh, 60 millimeter film to electronic news gathering uh, using three-quarter inch tape instead mm. and yeah that was so basically you ended up with a crew that was you know six or seven strong uh, and we're now down to one person and actually in some cases yeah. iphone video can yeah. we not do iphone video but ladies and gentlemen could you well, do I, a proper video and, and yes. bring, it, bring it back to airlines uh, in Australia, when the 767 came out, the engineering union had so much power that Boeing created a 767 with two pilots and one flight engineer. Right. And I, I have been that. on yeah, that yeah, flight yeah. deck yeah. and yeah. I've hung out yeah. and the flight engineer had one screen and a few switches and was really just being carried along because they were not required. The, 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 you know, the computer automation did everything, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I do remember being on a seven six seven flight deck that had a flight engineer. Yeah, that was because of the power. Weird. That's yeah. so strange saying that. I just, I, I don't know. I, I just, hmm. I, I, I get you know things move on, obviously, and you know, looking at again at my, the the industry that I work in. I mean, I dare say, hopefully not in my lifetime, but uh, there will be a time where essentially. You know the buses and coaches that are carrying people around will be autonomous. It's essentially, um, you know, an an expanded version of the same technology that they're going to use here with these snowplows. I mean, it's uh, it's just uh, it's it is. I guess you can't stop it, can you? It's going to happen. So, as you say, uh, retrain and get them to to, mm. to learn new crafts and, and reinvent. And, yeah, reinvent the the wheel yeah. if you like, and, and move on. The person reinvent the person reinvent the person. And on the subject of moving on, I think we should go. Yes, next one, Two Matt, story. for you. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is a good Airbus story for uh, China Eastern. Indeed. So uh, not, a, not a site I think we've used before. So it's the International Flight Network. And the uh, headline is China, Airli uh, China Eastern Airlines receives its first Airbus A350. So China Air Eastern Airlines, the largest Airbus operator in Asia, has taken delivery of its first 
Airbus A350-900 on Thursday. The aircraft registered as Bravo 304 Delta. Uh, a new registration format for China was flown from Airbus's Toulouse facility, where the aircraft type is being manufactured to the airline's home base in Shanghai. The brand new aircraft features a four-class cabin layout with 288 seats and is equipped with onboard Wi-Fi connectivity. It will initially operate on domestic routes such as Shanghai to Beijing and... Oh... <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Guangzhou. Gu Guangzhou. Say that again, Grant? Guangzhou. Guangzhou. Well, I so. think it's Guangzhou, but I've been wrong I'll before. Take, I'll take it as far as better than what I had in my head. So it's a, such a Shanghai to Beijing and Guangzhou, we, uh, followed by flights to international destinations, uh, including Frankfurt, Sydney and Vancouver. China Eastern has a total of 20 A350 airplanes on order, which will be delivered from 2018 through to 2022. At the end of October 2018, Airbus had recorded a total of 890 firm orders for the A350XWB, uh, that's extra wide body, isn't it? Hey, hey. Correct. Uh, from 47 Yay! different <laughs> customers <laughs> worldwide. There we are. It's actually, I'll, I'll see if I can just pop that picture up actually, because that's uh, it's um, a nice looking aircraft. I, 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 I so want to try the 350 because I've, I've tried, I've done the Dreamliner a few times now, and I want to see how good the 350 is. So I think for next year's long haul flights, nice. yeah, I want to uh, see if I can try and get. Um, you know, get a flight on the three hundred and fifty and see what see what the see what it's like. See what the fuss is all about. Yeah. Is it's it like, is it good? Well, is it, watch uh, Grant? Had, my watch has a barometric altimeter on it, and I can assure you that the altitude at cruise was lower than in other such uh, you know, like a seven three seven or an A three eighty. Really. Um, so it was. It, it did help. Um, I don't think it's quite as as much of a pressure differential as you get on an air on a seven eight seven. I may be wrong on that, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I had uh, th I did three legs on a Singapore A350, and it was lovely. Uh, yes, business class does help, but uh, the rest of it was still pretty <laughs> really? good. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel as bad. Yeah, no, I bet. Moving on to the next story, and uh, Nev. Yeah, it's on the simpleflying.com website. And although BA have just said goodbye to their last 767, uh, they've got some new hardware on board uh, now with the uh, A321neo. And BA already operates uh, 18 a321 200s in a european style format or a domestic version with one class throughout economy although british airways does operate an all business class a318 flight from london city to new york their current fleet consists around 200 passengers in its more denser version but the new 321 neo is pushing that capacity up to 235 passengers in a one class 33 configuration this means that their future a321 uh, a321 neo fleet of 10 jets which will be delivered throughout 2019 will have seating to match their a320 neos there'll be a club europe cabin on this plane but this is just economy with the middle seat blocked out with an improved soft product uh, the economy seats will have approximately 29 inches of pitch between each seat which is one inch smaller than ryanair uh, this makes sense as the jets will be used for short haul routes such as, such as uh, over to Western Europe and Scandinavia, but also adds fuel to the fire that British Airways is downgrading to compete with Norwegian and other low cost carriers. If that wasn't enough, EasyJet has the A3, A321neos and reportedly utilise the exact same cabin configuration as British Airways. So the idea that you'll get more room on a British Airways flight over a low-cost carrier truly is in the past. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of advantage, of course, of flying the new aircraft. First, the engines and cabin will be a lot quieter, so up to 50% in some cases, which will be a great thing for travellers. The cabin structure will also make pressurisation more comfortable with additional humidity and warmth. And these are uh, items of simple advancements of technology that beats out using a much older plane, such as the 30-year-old 767 that was retired. Additionally, the plane will be far more fuel efficient and a more versatile addition to the British Airways fleet, ultimately allowing them to be more competitive and offer lower prices for customers. Uh, well, that's good stuff, isn't it? And they're going to take delivery. In fact, uh, their first um, service starts today uh, on the Heathrow to uh, Oslo and Dublin services. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so that'll be good. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated to, to learn. I want to know what their new soft product is. I, I just, it's the seat cushions. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was looking at the seating plan, Nev. <laughs> looking at the seating plan for this, Nev, and I, mm. I, I'm looking at, and looking at the. Um, Rows 22, 22I and 22F, I think, are going to be a very popular seat on this aircraft. Four leg room is near the yeah. 3L and 3R door. Um, seat guru time. Yeah, and also uh, rows or row 8, um, I think, is going to be a popular A, B, C, D, E, F, rows 8 on near the, the two left and second right or two right door. I think these mm. are going to be a very popular seat because it looks on the seating plan, it's going to be a, a lot of leg room. In those particular yeah, seats, definitely, definitely. Do, yeah, definitely. Uh, do do BA charge more for the legroom, Nev, with their uh, economy? Oh, tickets? they do. Uh, yeah. They can do sometimes. If you want an emergency exit seat? Again, depends on when you book the flights. Uh, oh, as right, always okay. with these things, you know, uh, I think everybody just makes it up as they go along. To be honest with you, I've got no <laughs> idea how anybody calculates a seat, uh, you know, on, on any airline these days in in terms of the, the prices uh, you can pay. So yeah, there, there's always lots of uh, options. There all depends on what status you are and also depends whether you can book your seat for free or whether they charge you for it as well. Well, I guess a seat is only worth as much as you're willing to pay for it. Exactly. <laughs> yep. So the last story in the commercial news segment this week is for Mr. McGarren, and it's a jet starry type Qantas story. Uh, it's Qantas again. Yeah, well, oh. Qantas jet stars. You know, jet stars, the low-cost carrier arm of Qantas. Yeah. Anyhow, airlineratings.com says Qantas Jetstar expand co-chair agreement. Qantas has expanded its co-chair agreement with Jetstar to allow passengers travelling between Australia and Thailand to use either airline on the same trip. Qantas is adding its QF code to Jetstar's Sydney Phuket, Melbourne Phuket and Melbourne Bangkok services. This means passengers will be able to travel with Jetstar on the outbound leg and return with Qantas, a move the airline says gives them greater flexibility. Oh, my God. Sorry, I'm just having visions of booking Qantas and winding up on a Jetstar plane. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no comment. Um, it's the Jetstar 787s, they're 787-8 with uh, 335 passengers on board. This is an aircraft that's sold by Boeing as a 220 to 240 passenger aircraft. No comment. Jetstar operates its Boeing 787 Dreamliners between Thailand and Melbourne and Sydney. It flies Sydney, Phuket Monday, Wednesday and Saturday and Melbourne, Phuket on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The Bangkok services run on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Bad luck if you want to go on Monday, unless you're going to Phuket. At least they have one then. Qantas customers travelling on Jetstar earn frequent flyer points and status credits, get a complimentary hot meal, pre-landing refreshment and seat back entertainment, as well as a comfort pack with a pillow, blanket, eye mask, and a shoehorn to get you in and out of your seat. <laughs> their international baggage allowance follows them for their entire journey and is checked through between the Qantas domestic Jetstar terminal in Sydney. They can also use the Qantas transfer bus when transferring between Qantas and Jetstar flights. The two airlines were initially kept separate, but Qantas now codes to 50 destinations on Jetstar group services to and within Asia. In other code share news, travelling between Hawaii and the US East Coast is set to become easier thanks to an expanded code share agreement between Hawaiian Airlines and JetBlue. JetBlue and Hawaiian are teaming up at Boston's Logan International Airport from April to code share on Hawaiian's new non-stop Honolulu flights. The code share is also available for JetBlue flights, blah, 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 blah. What the <laughs> hell does that bit have to do with Jetstar and Qantas? Oh, dear, dear, dear. It's just because it's got JetBlue and Jetstar, I guess. It probably tripped a... Uh, a Doctor, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, so, come on. For, for the padding for, article. Yeah. For, the, for the benefit of the listeners, uh, Grant, um, summarise Jetstar in one, in one sentence. No, no, I'm frightened Friend? of bad language. No, 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 no. 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 It's, hey, it's PG. It's PG. Okay, far away. My, my apologies to all my Jetstar pilot friends, <laughs> but fri friends don't let friends fly Jetstar. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I look, in, in the domestic world, the A320s and A321s have about a 29-inch seat pitch. They do have scalloping on the back of the seats in front, but, um, you know, I'm not a svelte guy. I, I'm six foot two. Uh, yes, I, I, I could lose 20 kilos and, and the world would be a happier place. But, uh, <laughs> but would you, you know, be, if though? I'm sitting, <laughs> yeah, well, if I'm sitting with my butt squeezed right to the back of the seat that I'm in, my knees are wedged into the seat in front. And, and to be fair, that's not got nothing fun. to do. That, 
that's got nothing to do with that and everything. The fact that you're six foot too tall has got nothing to do with anything else. Oh, it's a contributing factor. It's also yeah. the narrow seats and all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know. All, all those things add up. And okay, for an hour flight, fine. But they've done the same kind of thing. I think they've got a 30-inch seat fit pitch. I'd have to check with Seat Guru. But their 787 is just obscene. I mean, you know, it's a 787-8. It, we, we thought Norwegian were being naughty with 290 passengers. Jetstar said, here, hold my beer and watch this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hey, we can get 335 people on. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the accountants are loving it. People are getting off that plane going, I'm never flying a 787 again in my life. Yeah. And Boeing's wow. like, but, but, but we made it to be better. Yeah. That didn't yeah. work. Yes. <laughs> no, no, because and as it, whenever you see some of these ad, um, ads or th concepts, like for you know the new middle of the market aircraft, the two airline short haul. Sorry, two. I'll start again. The two aisle short haul. I mean, you know, they, they, and and you've got bloody. Uh, so you see the pictures there, and you think, yeah, maybe, maybe. But then you you think maybe they could probably squeeze an extra on in by making the aisles narrower using smaller carts, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, then you see Joyce, um, talk, you know, Alan Joyce here from Qantas Jetstar down here, um, and, and he's talking about, oh, well, maybe we could have sleeping stuff down the bottom, you know, take out some freight. Oh, we could even put like a bar or something down there. And mm. it's like, yeah, bull dust. You're going to milk every single piece you can. This, the Qantas 787-9s that are doing nonstop Perth to a London Heathrow, they've got economy in the back, and it's a nine abreast economy. And sure, it's 32-inch seat pitch, but I think it's about 17-inch width. Mm. It's definitely well under 18 inches. And, you know, once again, you, know, you, you get people saying, yeah, I survived. It's, it's like <laughs> I had to get there in a hurry, so I went, but God, never again. Mm. <sighs> there we go. Nope, that's news for you there. Don't fly Jetstar. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, that closes the end of the uh, commercial news segment for this Good, week. Good, because I'm worried we're going to get sued. Um. <laughs> so for uh, for the next part of the show, we are going to hand things over as it is. Oh, I'm, I'm really excited. Time. You have no idea how excited over I am about this. Over to Mr. Bounds to introduce this awesome part of the show. Well, thanks very much indeed, Carlos. Yes, everybody is very excited, and with good reason too, because uh, uh, this gentleman, Sir Richard Johns, uh, Chief of the Air Staff, has written a book called Bolts from the Blue, uh, From Cold War Warrior to Chief of the Air Staff. And uh, we decided that um, because the publishing company asked us to do an interview, we would do it properly, and therefore we needed someone proper to interview him so uh captain nick anderson very kindly agreed to do that so he and i went down to sir richard johns's house in wiltshire a few weeks ago and now we join captain nick in sir richard's garden we're delighted to talk to retired air chief marshal sir richard johns knight grand cross of the most honorable order of the bath knight commander of the royal victorian order Commander of the Order of the British Empire and Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. A fighter pilot in the 1960s, Sir Richard served as one of three British directors of the operations on the senior planning staff for Op Granby during the First Gulf War in 1991 and then acted as a supporting commander for joint operations in the Balkans in 1994. As Chief of the Air Staff, he advised the British government on the Air Force aspects of the Strategic Defence Review and on NATO's air campaign in Kosovo. We are here to talk to him about his book, a memoir of his time in the service, entitled Bolts from the Blue. Sir Richard, I'm delighted that you've uh, allowed us to come and talk to you about your new book, which I might say has got a fantastic painting of you on the cover. That is amazing. Bolts from the Blue. Um, so let me first ask you, um, having enjoyed your book, um, particularly your recollections of flying the Hunter FR-10 on 1417 flight and, of course, the Harrier, um, who do you imagine your book's audience to be uh, when you wrote it and to who, whom do you think it will mainly appeal? 
Well, I think the first part of the book will, I hope, appeal to people who've got a genuine interest in flying aeroplanes, because the first part of the book is very much about my various experiences on various types of aeroplanes. And I, I was inc incredibly lucky because I didn't just stay on one aeroplane. You know, I moved around a lot. So if anything, I became, dare I say, you know, a jack of all trades rather than something like a master of one. And then, of course, and as, as one became more senior, the focus of one's life changed in, in a sense that uh, although flying was still very important, you know, although one grabbed every opportunity to... Um, expand one's knowledge of various types of aeroplanes and the military role of those aeroplanes, other aspects in one's life became more important. And I thought it particularly necessary to try and record in the book, partly for historical value, as it were, partly for general interest to people who've got uh, a, a wider interest in defence, what exactly was happening to the service at the end of the Cold War until I retired. So rather hopefully it'll appeal to a very wide audience uh, and rather hopefully those who start reading the book about aeroplanes and so on will continue to get a wider picture of the RAF's history over the second half of the last century. I'm sure that will prove to be the case. Going back to your early days as a young man, probably not that ever going to imagine you were going to reach air rank, <laughs> let alone be the most senior man yeah. in the Royal Air Force. Um, you were out there in uh, uh, Salala and uh, you were flying uh, your photo reconnaissance hunters. Fighter reconnaissance. Uh, thank you, FR, fighter reconnaissance. Um, now, I was intrigued by some of the missions you flew, particularly one that required you to shut down the engine had you diverted because of the enormous distance between you and your diversion airfield so that you could reach it with enough fuel to relight it and land. Was that within the rules at the time? Yeah, I mean, that's what we were briefed to do. I mean, we were <coughs> flying out of um, Salala. Um, Mazera is about, I don't know, 300 nautical miles, you know, up to the northeast of uh, Salala. Um, we had a, another airfield over the Jebel, to, to the north of Salala, if you know that area, there's the Jebel, and then you're in, getting into the desert. And there was an airfield there, which I think is, I think it's called Thumrate. In those days, uh, it was known as Midway. It was a very small airfield used by uh, oil prospectors uh, and so on. Um, the trouble was that uh, Salala was a sand runway. And uh, we were flying hunters off it with you know, high pressure with tires and there were no crash facilities at Salala. So when we came back uh, to the airfield, we would sort of go out into a very long line astern. Um, so one guy, would, the, the leader would touch down first uh, so that you were not, you know, you knew that at least you had a runway to land on and you hadn't burst a tire. Uh, uh, otherwise, if you had burst a tire, the brief, and this is, I mean, brief diversion technique was to immediately blow the tanks off, turn left or northeast, because we were obviously at the Herring South uh, for um, Mazera, and then do what we called a light climb up to 36,000 ish, because we had no MET uh, facilities or, or whatever, and we took 36 as the average height of the, of the tropopause, and so on, and off we set. And uh, I forget the actual gliding distance out, but the brief was that when they were about 100, I forget, 100, 150 odd miles out, you flame the engine out and you glid. And if everything worked out right, according to our planning, you would end up at Mazera, 2,000 feet downwind uh, to land when you relit the engine and you landed. Now, that was the, that was the brief concept, uh, not concept, that was what we were briefed to do. Fortunately, we didn't have to do it because no one burst a tire. Well, thank the Lord for that. Well, it would have been interesting, you know, to see if it worked out. <laughs> it, it would have been. Um, flying around those areas, being shot up by the odd tribesmen and things, it must have been a wonderful place to cut your teeth as a young fighter pilot. Well, yes. I mean, the, 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 the operations that we were doing up in Amman were very different from our standard day-to-day -day stuff down in what was then the Federation of South Arabia. Um, the strike wing at the time had uh, two hunter squadrons, 8 and 43, flying the Hunter 9. There was 14, 17 flight. There were just six of us on that flight, and we were fighter recce people. And then, believe it or not, we had a Shackleton squadron in strike wing uh, uh, as well. They used to drop 1,000-pound aerial grenades, <laughs> you and me as 1,000-pound bombs, uh, when, when required. 
Um, but on 1417, we were all um, at least second tourists. Uh, uh, on 1843, they obviously had a, most of the junior pilots were first tourists. And you're absolutely right. It was a smashing place for them to go, you know, to cut their teeth, as you put it, in an operational role. Absolutely. And in the last two years, we never lost a pilot. Well, that's a tantamount to the uh, supervision and the fact that uh, they were pretty good hands in those days. Well, they're very high quality leadership. In fact, it was, the, both squadrons were commanded by squadron leaders in those days. And uh, the flight commanders were obviously were senior flight lieutenants. We were all flight lieutenants uh, on 1417. Um, and as I say in the book, we got the, the, the JPs used to call us 14 canteen. <laughs> because the flight commanders and the senior flight lieutenants used to come across to our place for a bit of peace and quiet and a cup of coffee every now and again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Moving you, you on, uh, I noticed that you mentioned you had a green endorsement. Now, not everyone will understand what that is and what a rare achievement uh, it is uh, in the Royal Air Force. Perhaps you could explain what it is and tell us a little bit more about oh. what you did to get one in your logbook. Um, well, I, I, my first tour, I was, I was a night fighter pilot on my first tour, uh, flying javelins. And um, we were on detachment uh, out in Cyprus doing an armament practice camp, uh, air-to-air firing against, you know, towed flags, towed by meters and so on. And uh, I, I was on the flag one day, and it was towing at about 20,000 feet. And it used to come in uh, on a, uh, it used to be perched about 1,500 yards out, I forget exact distance, about 1,500 feet higher than the toe. And then you were coming on a curve of pursuit, um, never less than 10 degrees uh, angle off to the towing aeroplane. Otherwise, they used to get very miffed. Um, and as you came in, the, the nav rad in the back would lock onto the tow bar to give you range. And your job, of course, was to uh, track the flag and fire at it. And of course, it was only a split second, then you sort of Roll the wings level, and you went over the top of the flag, you know, ne never uh, underneath it. And on this particular occasion, as I went over the top of the flag, I started to roll and then sort of to sort of ease the stick forward. And I suddenly realised the stick was absolutely jammed solid um, in the fore and aft plane. I, could, I had aileron control, but I had absolutely no uh, tail plane control uh, on it. It's it absolutely solid. Um, so we just went on up. And I thought, hmm. And so I then st I thought, well, if I'm going up now, because that means the stick has obviously got the tailplane up. So if I roll the aeroplane upside down, it'll start going down again, you know, like actually right doing a barrel roll. Mm. So we, that's basically what we started doing. These huge barrel rolls. Unfortunately, because I was high, there was room about. So you start throttling back and you start thinking. And I told my leader, Daryl Ken Scott, I said, I've got a bit of a problem. I've got the, the, the stick's jammed. It, it's absolutely, you know, I've got no elevator control or tailplane control and anyway to cut a very long story short eventually by using you know you had these huge variable air brakes in, in the javelin and by basic aerodynamics you know using the, the air brakes to get the speed back uh, throttle you know, push, if you push right and the nose will go up pull it back the nose will go down sort of thing got it into reasonable straight and level flight and by there's a teeny weeny bit of um, of, uh, of vertical control on, on the on the trimmer, just a teeny weeny bit, and I discovered that when I got the speed back, you know, below you know, two hundred knots, I could uh, get the get the gear down, and then I also discovered again by fiddling around with both the power and the air brakes, I could set up a rate of descent. Ken Scott told me, and he'd also been on the squadron up at RAF Nicosia to put the airplane over uh, Akrotiri at 10,000 feet, pointed out to sea and eject. Well, we got down there and um, I said to Dave Holtz, who was my navigator, I said, OK, I'll put you at 10,000 feet over the airfield, which was the optimum height for ejecting, and out you go. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but I've got a feeling that if I can get, I can get the airplane far enough out, we can actually fly, you know, a, a, a stand of about 500 foot, 600 foot rate of descent and I will aim it at the runway threshold. Acroteria, of course, was a very, very long runway. Still is today. And that's basically what I did. Um, and we hit the... Uh, well, we hit, I forget how far up the runway. It was a long time ago. But I hit the airfield going pretty fast. Uh, in the normal speed, roundout speed in the javelin, I think it was about 145, 150 knots. When I hit it, I think I was doing about 170, 180. 
and the airplane bounced up in the sky and I thought, oh God, I've blown it. And, uh, but fortunately, because of that huge delta wing uh, that it was, that sort of cushioned the blow when we hit the deck and uh, we, we cleared the runway. And um, so uh, I, you know, we taxied off. Actually, it was quite amusing because it was also, well, from my point of view, as a very feckless flying officer at the time, it was also the day of the AOCNC's inspection, annual inspection of RAF Acretary. And we have been told uh, up at Nicosia, no diversion to Acretary unless it's for real. Well, the parade was all out. This is what I've been told, uh, how true it is. But all of a sudden, the crash alarm goes and half the parade disappears. <laughs> now, that's what I'm told. I can't vouch for that. But a servicing party came down from Acretary, uh, was flown down by Chopper, direct from, um, from Nicosia. And they found basically a bolt that got stuck in the uh, control lines somewhere or the other. And... Um, that, that, yeah, and they took it out and boss phoned me up and said, right, do some, you know, make sure everything works, fly it back to Nicosia. So I flew it back to Nicosia that evening. Wow. And um, later on, they gave me the green endorsement. Well, AOC 11 Group, I think, was gave me the green endorsement, which is basically something nice to have in your log book where it says, you know, you, you did a good job. As opposed to a red endorsement, which I have to admit I wasn't aware of. Uh, oh, yes. I, the, 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 as, I th as I said, I, I, there was one chap on the squad who had a red endorsement in his uh, log book uh, from Meteor Days, and he also had a green endorsement. He got them both on the same sorting. A red endorsement for taking off with no fuel at night and the green endorsement for bringing the aeroplane back and dead sticking it without a scratch on the aeroplane. I wonder if the, his AOC might have had a bit of a sense of humour. They didn't seem to have much sense of humour in those days, but that's just a personal recollection. I love it, I love it. Um, now, you went on to become a flying instructor, and of course you had a, a student which some of us would have looked at as a, as a gift from heaven, and others would have avoided like the plague. In other words, you were asked to train a member of the royalty, so mm. perhaps you could explain a little a, a bit about that. Well, I mean, I, when I, I, I went, I, I was a non-volunteer for CFS when I left uh, 1417 flight. And um, someone on the flight said the best instructing to do is basic instructing. You don't want to do this advanced stuff. Well, anyway, I went to Risington. And one trip in the Jet Provost Mark III convinced me that the one thing I didn't want to do was basic instructing. So I promptly volunteered for the NAT and I, I instructed on the NAT for a while. Uh, and then I was promoted to squadron leader. And uh, I thought, well, I've done my instructing. I'll now go back, you know, to the front line because Phantoms, Buccaneers, Harriers were all coming into service. And my postings officer told me, nope, um, you're going to go to Cranwell uh, and command a Jet Provost Squadron. So this was not good news. But anyway, having said that, when I got to Cranwell and uh, I discovered there was more to basic instructing than I, um, than I thought, and the Jet Provost Mark IV, of course, was not... Well, it was a marked improvement on the Jet Provost Mark III. And anyway, there I was, I was instructing, I was commanding a squadron, I had some very interesting students uh, going through at the time. And uh, I then went to become Deputy Chief Flying Instructor, and when I was there, uh, and I'd been at Cranwell, I suppose, at that stage for about a year and a half, something like that, I suddenly got uh, you know, phoned up to be told to report to the Commander-in-Chief Flying Training Command. And so I said, what for? And they said, do what you're told and go down there and report <laughs> to see him. So I went down to, I think it was to Brampton, and the outer office gave me no I was thinking, what the hell have I done now? Sort of, you know, get that feeling of all those sort of little guilt complexes come back to you. And I went in to, marched in to see the commander in chief, who was uh, Air Marshal Derek Hodgkinson, Air Vice Marshal Derek Hodgkinson at the time. He was the acting CNC. And he said, well, sit down. And then he just said to me, how would you like to be the Prince of Wales' flying instructor? Was it, that was a real bolt from the blue. I bet it was, absolutely. Was it a bit under the covers, a bit hush-hush at the time? Well, I, I don't know how hush-hush it was. I mean, what I do know, of course, is that uh, when he was at uh, Cambridge, Prince of Wales joined the UAS, and a chap called Squadron Phil Pinney was his flying instructor there, and he went through the UAS course and got his private pilot's licence. And that's when he decided that he would like to you know, come into the Royal Air Force and to get his wings proper, you know, no, nothing sort of shortcutted. I he did the full jet uh, training phase to, to get his wings, and the Royal Air Force, you know, I, I think dare I say, rather reluctantly, agreed to this, uh, because believe you me, there, there, there was really considerable concern 
uh, about the not the security, the safety of the heir to the throne, because if you cast your mind back, you know, to the 60s, the accident rate in the Royal Air Force, well, it was a damn sight better than it was in the 50s, yeah. but it was still, you know, I mean, the year before this was a being, I didn't see, we lost 68 pilots, I think, in six, or 68 air crew, I should be more accurately say. And so there was con very considerable concern um, about his safety uh, in the Royal Air Force. And you know, I didn't really, I suppose, ha ha what is the word? I, well, I just said, well, yeah, well, fair enough. I can't remember what, what went on in the interview. But as a consequence of that interview, I, I was sent down to the Queen's flight and I converted onto the Bassett, which was, in my view, one of the most dangerous airplanes I've ever flown, <laughs> that's by the way, uh, which Phil Pinney was instructing him on at the, well, he was doing a bit of instructing while basically being a cab driver and mm -hmm. taking him around the country. So I converted onto the Bassett and I then got an instructor's ticket on the Bassett and I had to get an air support instrument rating, which was uh, air support command, was it? I think it was air support command, um, instrument rating. And that, they gave me about, I forget, two and a half months to do that lot. And then Phil disappeared to go to staff college. And then I took over the job of cab driver and instructing uh, Prince Charles at basically, in fact, did, funny enough, most of it at night in not very good weather. So I got to know him. Mm. And then in, I think it was late February, March, that's when he joined the Royal Air Force as a member of one graduate entry at Cranwell. And I, meanwhile, had kept current um, on the Jet Provost. And we got these two brand new Mark Fives um, that were you know, almost tailor-made for the job. And I got my own flight, my own airman, and I had a deputy. And uh, we went back to Cranwell and got on with the job. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I, have, I have no words. Wow. Nev, that is absolutely fantastic. What a, a fascinating afternoon that must have been to be, uh, to be in, in that lovely gentleman's company. And uh, wow, well, well. Nick has done everything. Every, Nick and has done everything that we expected him to do. Let's be honest. Yeah, and uh, I, th I think the other thing is there's obviously there's another five parts to this story, but it's it's a fascinating insight into this gentleman's career. Uh, but uh, vitally, um, Lady Elizabeth, his wife, very kindly made us lunch. As oh. well. Some very nice homemade bread, cheese, and the sort of thing you'd expect. Uh, for a, uh, for that that kind of person, so the caliber was, uh, of gentlemen. Yes, yes, precisely right. I, so I was, know, uh, lovely. Yeah, I know that when well, I said to you, I think I said to you, Nev, that when I, when I first listened to the first part of this, um, when you would edited it a, a while back, or was it a week ago? You done the first part, wasn't it? I think you'd edited yeah, the but, first part, uh, yeah. and I was at work listening to this, <laughs> dealing with chemicals. And I completely switched off from what I was doing. Oh, that's comforting. Um, whilst <laughs> listening to this, I uh, was measuring out chemicals. And uh, I, I thought, I'm, obviously, I didn't blow up, so I, I'm still here. No. But uh, totally <laughs> lost myself because it, it's just immersing, Nev. It's so, you know, it's just it is. A, a brilliant. And I've listened to um, the first three parts. And uh, they are they are also yeah. just like, better and better. It's just, just fantastic work, Nev. So well done. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, and of course, and our personal thanks must go to Captain Nick as well. For, yes, for his time for for asking the questions and doing. Uh, I think it's fair to say, Nev, quite a lot of research before he uh, he, he met up with him. Oh yes, he? a lot. Yeah, it's all very well reading the book, but uh, you've got a lot of research as well. Mm. So he did all that and uh, wrote his script uh, for the intro, and also there's a, a an outro at the end of part six as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, a very very good job indeed. And uh, yeah, Nick, Nick did a, a very nice. Uh, very nice job there, I think. Absolutely, as did you, sir. Thank you very much for for doing it. I can't wait. Well, I can't wait till for part two next week. Exciting. This is, this is brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Grant, how are you still here? He's unmuted, He's but we still can't mute. hear him. Excellent. Good. Okay. Excellent. He'll come back to us momentarily. Then. Okay. Oh, there he is. How about that? Yay. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> bloody hell. Technology. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, absolutely. So, so we're going to move on with the show then. And, so what, what, uh, was you, what was your thoughts, just out of interest, uh, uh, Grant? Oh, quite fascinating. He's had uh, quite the career and uh, many amazing experiences. I may have to see if I can get a copy of his book on uh, ebook and all that. It's, mm. uh, it's from all that I've heard, it's, it's pretty cool. But I did note his use of the word glid, apparently yes. the past tense of glide. <laughs> 
Ah, I see. Okay, well, that's fine. When he was talking about we had to glid, we, we glid down. <laughs> to be fair, if you're a knight of the realm, uh, Sir Grant of you McCary, could you could do whatever the bloody yeah. hell you want. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, I mean, you know, it's like that, the Pope, the Cardinal, the Queen, exactly. I mean, you know, they could do whatever they want. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> never mind, never mind the terrible dialect we all speak. That's the, you know, if, if oh, he's... Oh, well, I done. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. If, if he says it's glid, that's fine by me, I'm telling you. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll have you know, well, well, I, I, I I read my bike. Yeah. One day. Oh, really? Uh, excuse yeah. me. Well, I, I've seen. I've seen what you posted on our on our on our Facebook page, mate. You've got no room to talk. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, I still <laughs> have more. Still have more followers though. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, anyway. anyway. moving swiftly on. You, um, you could you could be channeling the Americans where they go drug it out to the open. Oh no. No. Yeah, drug. I think it's a war on drug, but you know. Yeah, I think. I th- yeah, I think we should move on now. Uh, so <laughs> next, then it's time to get some military news uh, done. There, we've got three stories this week. Three really good stories. So, if everyone's ready, uh, yes, we are. Let's, Let's go. go. So the first news story on the military news segment this week is on skynews.com and uh, as we all know here in the UK we've got a very nice shiny new aircraft carrier but um, there may be an issue here because the headline is Royal Navy and Royal Air Force locked in a dogfight over new jets that cannot fly from the warships. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> so Britain risks reducing the fighting power of uh, two new aircraft carriers uh, and damaging ties with the US because of a row over jet defence as sources have warned. Two sources who are close to the Royal Navy accuse senior Royal Air Force officers of privately pushing for a version of a supersonic warplane that can only fly from the land to be included in an initial purchase of 48 F-35 jet, Lightning II jets, uh, instead of them all being able to operate from ships at sea. They said any cut in the number of next generation F-35 aircraft that can take off and land from HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales would be a huge mistake. Shrinking the size of the squadrons to each, three billion carrier will be equipped to carry in the coming years. This will completely undermine the whole carrier program, one source told Sky News. There is no operational reason whatsoever for the Royal Air Force to have uh, the A, the land base variant of the F-35. If it can't fly from an aircraft carrier, it shouldn't be purchased. The source continued that the Navy is angry, but more to the point, the Navy cannot believe the Royal Air Force will put itself serving agenda above what is best for the nation. It's an absolute disgrace, he said, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen, and it has to be stopped here and has to be stopped now. The Ministry of Defence insisted that the policy remained for the uh, first 48 F-35 jets, more than a third of which have already been delivered, with the rest coming online by 2025 to be the carrier-capable B variant. The UK plans to buy a total of 138 of the Lockheed Martin aircraft without stating which variant over the lifetime of the US-led program. The Royal Air Force source dismissed the sources claiming as feels like a rumour from the ill-informed. However, sources who have knowledge of the discussions taking place about the complication of the F-35 fleet said a final decision on the last batch of 13 jets out of the 48 does not formally have to be made until the back end of next year. Now, it's safe to say that if we've got these nice, shiny new aircraft carriers, it would be helpful if we had a, a carrier-based aircraft that could uh, take off and land on said carrier. Mm. Do we not agree? No? No? <laughs> Look, it does yes, make sense. If, if focusing on that, yeah. I think it'd certainly be much more useful. Um. I, I, I would have, I would have said it would have made a lot more sense to sort of do a half and half split, you know, half uh, you know for the uh, for the Royal uh, Air Force and half and Navy. Here's, here's the thing. Go here's the thing to consider, Sir Carlos. The F thirty five B and C refuel via probe and drogue. Ah. Your Voyager tankers only have probe and drogue, unlike the KC thirty MRTTs that Australia is running, which have the probe and drogue and the flying boom. So if they go and get a whole bunch of A's, which admittedly are about twenty million dollars an aircraft cheaper than the B's, then um, yeah, you've got to go and get a whole new refueling capability if you want those suckers to be able to have air to air refueling, because uh. the A's only do flying boom. 
What Damn, you that's more money to spend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've already so we've got plenty of that, obviously. Yeah, kicking around. You'd have to retrofit your Voyagers with the fa famous flying boom and the uh, 3D refueling ta uh, screens. Uh, it's really quite cool up on the flight deck. So, yeah, that's that's a... Sure, we could, by getting 20... A models instead of the last 20 years A's instead of B's, we're saving you know quite a few hundred million dollars, but or pound as the case may be. But the um, the problem is now you turn around and uh, yeah, let's go get a whole lot of new voyages. How much is that going to cost you? Plus also the spares are not a hundred percent the same. Mostly they are. The pilots train pretty much the same because the uh, you know there's a button you push that drops the hook or the button that pushes it that you push that drops you into um, hover mode are pretty much the same based on the cockpit sim. But, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting one. They haven't committed to all Bs or As or, or even Cs, but because um, if they went not with the A but with the C model, which is beefed up to land on a carrier but only operated them off the land, then they would have probe and drogue and everything would be fine. So maybe they do that. Uh, Micah, our main man Micah in the chat room has put uh, the A's have better range and greater manoeuvrability. He's Correct. also said that the uh, the A pilots can't fly the B or the C. Ooh, don't know quite about that. Uh, it's not that big a transition. Well, okay. Admittedly, I was getting the demo version when I flew the cockpit sim, but uh, it's it's the cockpit is laid out the same whether it's the A, B, or C, and. Uh, the computer does most of the flying for you. You just have to think a, a slight bit differently. So it would be sort of like, I suspect, I, I, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but from what they were showing me, it was like going from a 777 to a 787. There's some classes to do and a little bit of sim, but on the whole, you can fly them. It's not like going from a from an F-14 or F-15 to an AV-8B Harrier, you know, or even a British GR Harrier, you know. Before we move on, I'm just going to say that the F-35 just looks such like an awesome jet. It really does. It does. I love yeah, the look I of that. that picture. I love, love the look of that it. so yeah. much. So Indeed. the next uh, story, uh, Nev, uh, is, is good news for uh, the F-35. They're all Air Force's F-35s. Yeah, continuing the story with the F-35s, uh, two of the RAF uh, F-35B Lightning Stealth Fighter Jets have taken to the skies over the North Sea as part of Exercise Point Blank. Uh, aircraft from the British, US and French Air Forces all scrambled together to practice what has been described as an insurance policy against global threats. It's the first time that the French Air Force have been involved in Exercise Point Blank, which is led by the US uh, Air Force's 48th Fighter Wing based at RAF Lakenheath in Suffolk. Uh, the exact details of the scenario are classified, but some of the aircraft were playing the enemy Enemy whilst the rest were trying to defeat them. Uh, Colonel Jason uh, Camilletti of the US Air Force said they'll be positioned throughout the North Sea. We'll also have simulated surface-to-air missile sites, getting that high-end contested environment that we quite frankly haven't had to face in the last couple of decades. In total, 200 personnel and 40 planes took part in the exercise, including typhoons from RAF Coningsby. Uh, what has been released is footage of an RAF Voyager refueling the F-35s and the French uh, Air Force, Raf is that pronounced Rafael's? Rafael. Um, Rafael. Yeah, Rafael. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, it was uh, carrying 106 tonnes of fuel, playing a vital role in allowing the jets to top up mid-flight. Uh, F-35s have previously conducted flight trials off the U.S. coast with the American F-35B aircraft, but, the, but for the French personnel who were flying in, the, in their jets, uh, working alongside the British aircraft was a new experience. Uh, the F-35 poses some new challenges, said Major General Luc de Rancor. Uh, every day, literally, we are involved in common missions, uh, added his major, uh, and uh, especially in the Middle East or in Africa, so we're used to working together. The possibility of facing similar threats in the future were also in mind. Uh, RAF for uh, Air Commodore Atterich, in particular Russia. Uh, we can see the environment is changing, and we can see that the challenge that Russia, Russia is giving to the international rules-based order, so we are the insurance policy. We are recognizing that through this scenario, that we've got the non-permissive environment, our ability to operate with our allies, the French and Americans, is paramount. Uh, all three air forces are keen to such uh, to see such cooperation continue. Uh, Major General Sir John Wood, 3rd Air Force Commander, U.S. Air Force, said that the consequences of not holding such joint exercises would be negative. 
So it's nice to see the little video that Matt played there. It's uh, awesome to see those uh, mm. those jets in formation together uh, from all the different uh, various forces across Europe. It's uh, and also um, it was above the clay, which would look rather nice. I did like that video, but uh, no, it's good to see that uh, we're all getting on very well with each other, and uh, it's also nice to see they didn't have to fly off quickly to go and intercept some Russians. So, yeah, um, well, there is that coming in from uh, somewhere. <laughs> dare, dare I mention this word Brexit? Just briefly. No, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> moving swiftly on. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. To the last story, <laughs> uh, which uh, is uh, for you, Grant, and it's uh, concerning a certain P3. And Grant's on mute. No, he's not. No, he's <laughs> he was not. there briefly, no, and now he's the, there. He is. It's, it seems I may, uh, it may be something to do with bumping my um, my connection to the computer. Anyhow, yeah, right. <laughs> You, you, yeah, it seems that when it doesn't work, I just yank the plug out, plug it back in, and the world's a rosy place once again. Good, excellent. Sounds like an awful lot of fun. So, Grant, <laughs> tell us, uh, tell us yes. about the RAAF P3s. Correct. The uh, the Australian Air Force, the RAAF, or RAF as we know it, is saying farewell after 50 years to its uh, AP3C fleet. Um, the article here from SLD Info, as in second line of defence, um, says that after 50 years of military service for Australia, the Orion P3 is being retired, leaving behind a legacy that continues, uh, sorry, includes rescuing sailors, searching for MH370 and Middle East missions. On Tuesday, the media was given a final flight on an AP3C Orion, the third variant of the plane since Orion's first entered the service, to undertake marine surveillance duties in 1968. I think it's the last of the real pilot's aircraft in the Air Force, Air Force Number 10 Squadron Commanding Officer and Wing Commander Colin Smith said. Uh, many other pilots suddenly jumped up and down on him on that, I can assure you. <laughs> we spent 10 years in the Middle East flying in support of the Army and the multinational coalition against terror over there, Wing Commander Smith said. And we've been doing border protection work for nearly 20 years now, with an aircraft continuously working to the north and northwest of Australia to protect the borders. The four prop Orions are being replaced with jet propped, uh, sorry, jet propelled P-8A Poseidons and unmanned MQ-4C Tritons. I could never see myself as being a jet jockey, but the P-8's biggest advantage is it's modern, Wing Commander Smith said. It's much more reliable than the P-3, that's the truth, and its computers and sensors are more capable, but it's not as robust or versatile as the P-3, in my opinion. Um... So they've got some reference to an ABC radio story. The low rumbling thrum for the four massive hut makes its way down the runway at RAF Base Edinburgh and heads into the rainy Adelaide sky. It sways and rocks. It creaks and it groans. It's louder and more elemental. Primitive experience in stepping aboard a modern passenger jet. Boy, I need to take that guy up in a tiger moth. Uh, <laughs> and for 50 years, the Orion has been Australia's eyes and ears all over the world. But the days of the last down and dirty warbird <laughs> in the Royal Australian Air Force are numbered. They're being replaced by the sleek and modern form of the new P-8 jets, which are essentially repurposed Boeing 737s. And soon the familiar side of P will be no more, blah, 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 blah. Um, to give you some background, guys, uh, Australia started with the P-3B back in uh, 1968, went to the C's, uh, C model. They got rid of all their uh, B models. One went to New Zealand, a whole lot went to Portugal, and a couple of them. Uh, have you ever seen the uh, Orion with the rotating dome on the roof? Yes, I have. Radar dish, like, like on your AWACS. Yeah, well, one of our P-3Bs went over and became the prototype for that, and another one went over to Lockheed and uh, was repurposed to U.S. Customs with one of those rotating um, you know, radar dishes on the top. Uh, so in the late 70s, we went to the Cs, and then between 97 to 2005, we converted to the AP3C, where they put a whole boatload of really cool new technology on board, which uh, <laughs> took a lot of effort because there was some integration if issues, but they figured it out eventually and got it all sorted. Um, I've had a few good chats with former uh, P3 engineers, electrical engineers, about the fun they had in that. Uh, they reckon that uh, the signals intelligence and electronic intelligence gathering on all of those aircraft was better than what was on the Nimrod, just to give you some perspective. Uh, there were rumours of a couple of the aircraft being um, super secret squirrel uh, signals intelligence gathering aircraft. Uh, they, they were never officially announced or acknowledged, and it was always rumours. But uh, we've gone from 18 AP3Cs. We're down now to six. Um, it's likely that two of them are the um, the signals ones. And the word is that, 
you know, we're getting 15 P8As and a six to eight Tritons, but uh, the word is that the last couple of P3s will soldier on until about 2023, which is rumoured to be because we're going to get some Gulfstream aircraft kitted out for signals intelligence and they will eventually replace them, but they're not going to come on until 2023. So the last few Orions will probably keep going till then. So it's not 100% getting rid of them. And for those who like to keep track of it, we lost a B model with the fire on the ramp at Edinburgh and uh, we lost a C model at Cocos Island back in 91. But uh, a lot of the C models have gone to the scrapping yards or to a number of museums around Australia and Haas in New South Wales at Wollongong where Wings Over Illawarra air show occurs. Mm -hmm. They've got two P3s, one of which is going to be apparently on static and one will be flying. And, uh, yeah, the RAF Museum itself has got one as well. So it's an end of an era, man, 50 years. It's pretty full on. It's a lot, and it's a long. I mean, it's a long time for anything to be in service, isn't it? Really, but it's uh, you know there is very much a a, a very love. Well, it sounds almost very much like a love hate relationship with said craft. Mm. But uh. <laughs> well, they take a bit of effort. I mean, they refer, when when we went through the F eighteen transitions and all this kind of stuff, and uh, they, they they're talking about maintaining them and all that. They talk about the bath bathtub curve. So everything's expensive at first while you're getting the hang of it and figuring it all out. Then you get into the middle where it's cheap as to run them and you know what you're doing and everything's really good. And then the aircraft gets old and long in the tooth and it starts costing you more and more per flight hour to run it. And that's where it starts going back up the other side. So it looks like a U. They call it the bathtub. But, uh, yeah, the, the P3 is well and truly into the, uh, the high side on the other end of the, the bathtub. But, mm. uh, you know, Air 50, well, Air 555 is rumoured to be the one that, well, it's going to replace it with, they think it's going to be Gulf Streams, but we'll see. But, uh, I mean, I, I took my father over to New Zealand a few years back for a 75th anniversary of Five Squadron that he used to fly with. And it was two, two or three years ago, it was the 50th anniversary for the Kiwis. They got their first aircraft before Australia. And, uh, yeah, my father was over there. Um, he was one of the ones that they really wanted to get back because he had been on both the Sunderlands and the P3s. So wow. that was pretty full on, meeting a lot of the guys who used to fly them back in the first days when they first turned up. So we're <laughs> going to move on to the uh, next uh, segment for the show. And, uh, Nev, uh, this one uh, was, uh, was sent to us by one of your friends, I think. Yeah, one of my industry colleagues, as I like to say. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've got quite a few of them who are into aviation uh, also. And uh, Neil Draper is a good chum of mine, and uh, he often we will often talk about you know aviation stuff in, in general. Uh, but he had shot a lot of material up at the uh, Battle of Britain uh, uh, air show at Duxford. Uh, this year and he said would you like to run the footage on your show and I said yes please and I took one look at it and I thought this is absolutely magnificent so uh, it requires no introduction really just have a look at this it's one of those rare things isn't it where actually people uh, need to sort of so if you are listening to the audio version of this show and we'll make sure we include links perhaps just to the video directly on because I know he's got it on his YouTube page is that right Nev? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll make sure that we uh, we, uh, we we include that so that they can they can see it. Here we go. Well now we get ready for the traditional finale to so many Duxford air shows over the years. Our Spitfire salute.
just wow. That's just such great wow. footage. Mm. How incredible was that? Actually, Armando's that? just said in the yeah. chat room, this, this is his dream flight, you know. Is it? Yeah, the really? Spitfire, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 so again, so apologies if you're if you're only listening to the audio version of this. Do please try and find this. We'll make sure that the the link to it is on on the in the the show notes. But uh, it, it is the the that bird's eye view in the cockpit, uh, and especially towards the end there. Both uh, me and Carlos here in the studio, we actually looked at each other as it the banked, break away yeah, as it did away. the breakaway thing. Yeah. It was just oh, I mean, I've, I had goosebumps sitting through watching all of that. Thank you. Was it Neil Draper? Did you say? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Neil did all the, the filming and editing of that. Just, well, just bravo! Thank yeah, you. Bravo. That was marvelous. Well yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So next, oh, we I feel have got, warm and fuzzy. <laughs> we've got uh, a very spe a special piece of feedback that was sent in by a certain uh, young man that's in the ch uh, chat room this morning. Our main man, Micah, Uncle right. Micah, and uh, we're going to play that out for you. Uh, well. Right now, if you're ready, Matt. So what have I got to do? I've got to play this. Have yes, I? you have. Yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Oh, you've been told. Happy birthday, Matt. 2018. In three, two. Regular listener, mailman David Abbey is a great guy. He's a true av geek and a lot of fun to hang out with, talk to, and even get into friendly arguments with. Sure, he scared me once. I mean, really frightened me. But that was the first time we met. You see. Brian Coleman and I were walking through the lobby of our hotel in Chantilly, Virginia, when Brian very quietly whispered to me, Is that guy staring at us? Next thing we knew, some stranger said, Hey, are you main man Micah? That was David. He recognized both me and Brian, which is scary to begin with because I always thought I looked different on the radio, or rather a podcast. You know, three inches taller and 50 pounds lighter. David saw right through me. And we've been good friends ever since that day. Terrific Tanya Wyman has great taste in music. Well, maybe not great taste, but at least very similar taste to me. She also loves a lot of the same food I do, too. On top of all that, and all her other wonderful attributes, she's a major av geek and regular listener, too. Tanya and I were friends before we met. In fact, the first time we met, she was saving a place for me in line in front of Katz's Delicatessen. It was... Hello, are you Tanya? Followed by a big hug, like long-lost friends. Good thing I made sure it was her first. I must say, terrific Tanya also has great taste in men. No, not me, silly. Her boyfriend Phil, of course. He's a great guy. Then there's my Kreplup brother, Eric. We've been best buddies for... Well, we're still trying to figure that out. We know it's longer than 20 years and less than 30. But you know, our memory has faded as we've aged. Both of us have a hard time remembering when we weren't a part of each other's lives. Eric's not an av geek, but don't hold that against him. He has a great appreciation for av geekery, but he's a foamer at heart. What's a foamer? Well, the most accepted definition is one who foams at the mouth when he or she sees a train. I guess you could say that a foamer is a rail fan who's gone over the top, kind of like Carlos when he sees an L-1011 TriStar. It's okay, though. Well, I don't want to give away any secrets here. I'm pretty sure David Abbey is a foamer, too. That's one of the many reasons why David and Eric got along so well when they met. Now, as you can tell, I really like this small group of people. People I think of as friends, and in one way or another, are in touch with a little bit almost every day. But there's a kind of accord of this group. That's Matt Smith. You see, I'm not sure we all would have managed to get together if it weren't for Matt. It was last November when Matt traveled to New York City to attend a conference. Knowing he was going to be in town, the group of us above arranged to meet with him and take him out to Katz's Delicatessen so he could experience a pastrami on rye with mustard, a knish, and a Dr. Brown's cream soda. A wonderful trio of Manhattan foods that go together like, well, like bubble and squeak. We had a great time, and we're all set for Matt's trip back to New York this November. I was ready to drive back down to the New York metropolitan area from up here in Portland. I had my hotel reservation set at my favorite Holiday Inn Express and began to work on the schedule. Eric and I started planning where we would go. There was Ben's Best Deli up in Queens, the place where the Kreplock brothers, that's me and Eric, that's where we had our first Kreplock together. It was a great idea, until Ben's Best permanently closed. Then there was Sarge's Deli on 3rd Avenue. Eric and I had never been there, so we tried it. 
Eh, adequate, but just not good enough for Matt Smith. We thought about traveling to Rutt's Hut in Clifton, New Jersey for a ripper. What's a ripper? It's an amazing frankfurter that's prepared in a deep fryer until it just rips open, served on a great bun, and usually with Rutt's homemade special relish, or mustard if you like. Yeah, I know. Sounds strange, but it's a delicious treat. We considered the State Line Diner in Mawa, New Jersey. A true Jersey-style Greek diner where you can order anything at any time, and it will always be delicious. Is it three in the morning, and you have a hankering for moussaka? No problem. Is it seven in the evening and you want Eggs Benedict? No problem. Want that Eggs Benedict Florentine style? Piece of cake. And speaking of cakes, they have their own bakery too. We figured our trip to New Jersey could include the Aviation Hall of Fame and Museum of New Jersey in Teterboro too. And maybe even a trip to my old homestead. Eric and I came up with this plan well over six months ago. We were ready to work it all out with David and Tanya. And then the news came in. Matt's encore performance in New York was canceled. Needless to say, we were crushed. And if Eric and I were crushed, well, I can't imagine how Matt felt. Well, maybe I can. Matt probably thought, well, thank heavens I don't have to fly all the way across the pond to be dragged all over to hell and back by a bunch of crazy Americans who want to stuff me with strange foods again. In any event, you were missed this year, Matt, especially by me. I know it's been a rough year for you, with a lot of difficult circumstances and strange situations. Bear in mind, however, that there are many people who hold you very dear and think of you as not just a friend, not even just family, but a good friend and special family. I am happy to be able to say I am one of them. And what better time to tell you all this than on your birthday? So for Plain Talking UK here in Portland, Maine, happy birthday, Matt, from your main man, Uncle Micah. One of the great things about being in charge of the cameras is I get to choose which camera is being shown at what time. So we're not going to be going to my camera for a little while. Uh, while <laughs> well, done, myself, but, uh, <laughs> well done, Micah. Well done. Thank you, Micah. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Yes, and I'm very, I, I would have been delighted to. I'll tell you what, uh, and I, I guess because you'd heard it, had you, Carlos, that's mm. why you sent me that particular picture, was it? Yes, yes, yes. yes. But uh, <laughs> yes, very fond memories indeed. Thank you, Micah. Can we move on now, please? I'm starving, <laughs> hungry now. I, I tell you what, I, I, sh I really should not have skipped breakfast this morning. No, you I'm should so not. hungry now. It's never the way forward. Anyway. Oh, anyway, moving on. Um, yeah. We ha have obviously got something to announce uh, on this show, and it's our Christmas competition. Ooh. Ooh. Very exciting. Yes. And uh, obviously, yeah, me, Matt, and Never not allowed to enter because we've got the answers here. But um, we are open to uh, everyone to apply mm. for the uh, before for you the do the questions. Actually, I, I have to say, dear sir, what's um, that? They're real stinkers. I know that this year <laughs> we thought because obviously our, our main prize is going to be uh, the amazing book there. Uh, Bolts from the Blue, as signed by yes. Sir Richard Johnson. Uh, perhaps you could give us a quick demo, Nev, and sort of. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, yes, by means. Yes. Ne got, there we go. There's uh, the there's real book. writing. Uh, real handwriting and everything. Yes, Ooh. absolutely. So that is going to be our star prize is, for. Yeah. For this year's Christmas competition, we've also got some other bits and pieces here. I'm going to put up on the. We've got um, this Avro Lancaster Mark III, uh, which is quite a detailed model, actually. For those of you watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see that. There's the Avro Lancaster. You've actually got to put the props on yourself. It's I was about to say, oh my god, the propellers have spun off. They're going in. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so we've got that as a prime. We've also got here uh, a six disc collection of War in the Air. This one is uh, actually going to be it's quite potent for this year, actually, because it's obviously been a big year for the Royal mm. Air Force. It has, yeah. uh, all about, uh, this has got the Lancaster in there as well, actually. It's quite a, it's good, uh, a BBC publication, that one. Yes. And we've also got this awesome book as well, the Dan Buster book, uh, The Life of Guy Gibson. There we go. For those of you, you can see there on the YouTube stream. There we go, which goes quite well with the uh, model as well. But uh, So we've got four great prizes there for you all to uh, to have a go at winning. What we're going to do, we're gonna got, we've got 12 questions this year. 12? 12 incredibly difficult questions. I will oh say God. that uh, Mr. Barron's helped me with uh, a few of these questions, so uh, they're, oh, they're quite difficult. Oh, it's your fault, is it, Nev? Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, so we've got 12 questions, and uh, if you want to give us your answers, email them in to us, your answers. 
Uh, I will put these questions as well on our Facebook page as well. For those of you who are listening to the audio version of the podcast, take yourselves over to our Facebook page and the uh, questions will be on there. I shall put them on there uh, this week for you to see. And what we're going to do, we're going to announce the winner on our last live show no. of... No, or no. first show of, this, of January. Yeah, it'll be a first, yeah, first, yeah, okay. first show in January. First show in January. So you've got plenty of time over Christmas to... Uh, to research them, research I would suggest. <laughs> so we are going to start then uh, with the first question on uh, our list here. And uh, for those of you who've been watching the show for some time, this will be an easy one for you. So first question. Is uh, uh, should we share the questions? Never. You got the questions up in your in front of you there. Uh, I, I think no, you I should be any... singing them on the first oh. question of Christmas, mate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, don't please don't. The 12, okay, the twelve so, Christmas, the twelve Christmas questions. Right. Okay. Me, me and Neville read right. these out. So anyway, so the first question is: uh, uh, What PTUK episode featured aircraft X-ray Mike six one two? So that's what PTUK episode? So that's what episode number? Featured aircraft X ray Mike 612. Okay, Nev, do you want to take the next one? You're going to have to do these because I don't. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll do it. Okay, that's fine. Go, then. So, uh, what is the ICAO code for the airfield that I learned to fly? So, that's what the uh, what is the ICAO code for the airfield that I learned to fly? Next one is apart from the Rolls Royce RB211. What other engine has powered the Boeing 757? So that's apart from the Rolls-Royce RB211, an engine we all know and love. What other engine has powered the Boeing 757? Question number four, which aircraft has the longest fuselage? That's which commercial airliner has the longest fuselage? That'll stump a few people, I think. So question number five, especially for Nev, this one. We all know that Nev loves British Airways, but what year did British Airways form the budget airline Go? And what year did Go merge into EasyJet? So that's a double barrel one there. I didn't know that. So we all know that Nev loves British Airways, but what year did Nev... Uh, did Nev did, did British Airways form? Yeah. Did Nev emerge budget. into easy? Yes, right. <laughs> did, okay, Nev, yeah. did British Airways form the budget airline Go? He might he might have owned Go. Yeah. And also, yeah. what year did Go merge into EasyJet? It's quite a quite a difficult one that one. Not kidding. Question me. number six. I'm guessing quite a few people may know this one. What did the Wright brothers do before inventing aircraft? So that's what did the Wright brothers do? before inventing aircraft. Question number seven. For those of you who watch uh, APG, will probably know it as a poster when when uh, when Jeff's in Studio One, APG headquarters, will recognise a poster behind, uh, behind him. But what year was the film Airplane released? So that's what <laughs> year was the film Airplane released? Love that comedy. So also, good. also known as Flying High in some parts of the world. <laughs> That was, the, that was the title, Flying High, okay. in Australia and New Zealand. There we go. Really? You heard it here first. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so question number eight, what airfield is the Queen's flight based at here in the UK? That's what airfield is the Queen's flight based at here in the UK? No, I didn't know that one. Ne Nev, Nev put that one in. That's quite a good one. And question number nine. Concorde is well known for her droop nose and it's used for takeoff and landing so the pilots have an unstructured view of the runway. On final approach, what angle is the nose selected to? So that's Concorde, as we all know, is known for her droop nose, which is used for takeoffs and landings. So the pilots have an unobstructed view of the runway. So on final approach, what angle is the nose selected to? Never already knows that one. So question number 10, where is Royal Air Force Aquateri situated and what is its ICAO code? So another double barrel one, God, we're being nasty here. So where is RAF Aquateri situated and what is its ICAO code? Number 11, the penultimate question, what year was Virgin Atlantic formed? So what year was Virgin Atlantic formed? And the last question. On the list, question number 12. Uh, this is quite hard. It's got a difficult one as well. This will take some investigating. So NASA 
operated a Boeing 747 SP. Now we were talking about them earlier on the show, weren't we? So NASA operated a Boeing 747 SP registration November 747 November Alpha. It was a 41-year-old airframe. But who was the first owner of this iconic airframe? So that's NASA operate a Boeing 747 SP registration November 747 November Alpha which is a 41 year old airframe but who was the first owner of this iconic airframe so there we go that's all the questions 12 questions in total get your answers to us by email wow. uh, send them in via email and uh, we'll put all the questions or oh, answers correct answers whoever's got them all right into a bag here in the studio in our January show, first live show in January. And we'll pick a winner out, four winners, because we've got four prizes. And, so uh, yeah. you're hoping that four people will get it right then? By the well, I'm yeah, hoping. I I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I will, I will put the questions on our Facebook on page, as face. I said, okay, on the yeah. Book of Face, for anyone who's listening to the audio show, uh, we'll have a look at. And, uh, yeah, hopefully yeah. we'll get okay. uh, plenty of listeners um, yeah, right. Fing Get fingers right. crossed, Carlos, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. But Carlos, I'm, I'm surprised you forgot question 13, the bonus one. How many rivets in the horizontal stabilizer of the aircraft <laughs> Carlos flies, and who put them there? That's, no, that's right too easy. That's too easy. That's too easy. Far too easy. Right. Okay. <laughs> so that is that is where we are going to bring uh, episode 245 to a close. So, um, yes, to get in touch with the show, uh, yes. you'll find ourselves on uh, social media. Uh, search for Plain Talking UK. Our email address to get your answers in as well as to send any comments, good or bad. We don't mind. It's all about developing the show for how you want to hear it. So uh, feedback is always appreciated or indeed uh, feedback to play out on the show. We would very much love. So it's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. That is podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. And, of course, the website, <laughs> www.plaintalkinguk.com. Dot com. Oh dear. You're Sorry, right. just look at the chat room. Mash right. has put okay. that she sees a lot of Google happening in her future. I suspect that there <laughs> may well be. Indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I like Micah's one. Airspeed velocity of a sw swallow. Unladen, laden, African, European. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, Nev, how many of those questions did you get right on your own? Come on. Uh, not that many. Right. <laughs> Although, um, the one, Carlos did ask me a question was uh, when we first started talking about them and I, I was surprised I got one spot <laughs> got on, spot on. Uh, which was uh, really amazing indeed so and you it wasn't your, the BA one you, you can put your earbud back in now I've, I've just realised why you took them out now. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. lots of nasty business going on in there, <laughs> yeah. indeed indeed so and that, uh, that is indeed what she said uh, so that is where we are going to bring <laughs> episode 245 to a close a massive thanks to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room this morning all the uh, usual family members members in there it's great to see you all this morning on a sunday wherever the time is in the world where you are yeah. and also a big thanks to everyone who downloads the show via audio version as well through all the relevant uh, yeah. stitcher and Podbean and all the usual places where uh, you, you can't it. say it can you itunes itunes, iTunes yeah <laughs> without tunes um <laughs> And also a big thanks as well to Grant McCarran, who's yeah. joined us. He's uh, he stayed up. It's about fifty million past twenty in the morning uh, in uh, in Australia. So uh, thanks, Grant, for you for joining us. It's been great to have you on the show. Mm. And he's on mute again. Oh, good. Right, yeah. that went well. Okay, well, either that or he has nothing. I'm not to on say. mute. It's it's the it's the microphone uh, drops out for some. I don't know what's okay. going on. It's technology, mate. But never mind. We're know, we're at the end now. Thank we you got very away much for it. putting up with my ramblings, and I hope that my uh, extended discussion about Australian P3s drove Captain L mad. <laughs> Um, you know, if he can't stand Fifty Shades of Grey aviation nerd version, military right. version, then, uh, you know, bad luck, mate. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and uh, also a big thanks to, of course, Nev yeah. for joining us today as well. Thanks, Nev. Yeah, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, great show once again. Look forward to some more next week. Uh, and, and again, my people, honestly, guys, uh, you guys have no idea how much work Nev does behind the scenes for this oh, show. Oh, blind! And I just, I, I just thank you so much, mate. Really, and, and that, that, as I say, part two of uh, Sir John's interview next, next week. week. I can't wait. Mm. Can't wait. I really can't. Yep, should be good. Yeah. So that's it then, everyone. Have a great weekend wherever you are in the world, and uh, enjoy your roast dinners or. Uh, roast teas, I suppose. Where Grant I've got a now. casserole. Oh, very nice, very yeah. nice. I'm now going off to the English Whiskey Company to go and purchase some 
to get really whiskey. hammered. Right. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay! So take do, care. Do everyone. we make? Do we? Do we make English? Yes, do, we do. Do we make whiskey? Do we? Yes. I, oh. It's not just Scotch, Irish, well, and yeah, American. That's it's, what I thought. There's, yeah, there we there's are. stuff in Tasmania down here. There's there's whiskies all over the world, mate. Wow, where they are? Well, there there you are. I know. There you are. Anyway, on that bombshell, it's See time you to all get next week. Take care, Take care guys. Everyone. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.